Good afternoon. It's shortly after 1.30. We are back in council session, starting with public hearings, item four on our agenda. We will begin with a public hearing on Supplemental Appropriation 2467 to the FY24 Operating Budget, Montgomery County Government, Department of General Services, Black Rock Center for the Arts, $260,000. The source of funds is General Fund Undesignated Reserves, a joint government operations and fiscal policy and education and culture committee work session is scheduled for April 3rd. Those wishing to submit material for the council consideration should do so by the end of business today. First speaker is Susan Jenkins. You have three minutes. Good afternoon, council members. Thank you for um, inviting me to speak today. My name is Susan Jenkins, and I'm the CEO of the Arts and Humanities Council of Montgomery County. I just want to say that, of course, our job at the Arts and Humanities Council is to make certain that all of the organizations that we support through funding from Montgomery County um, uh, thrive. Uh, that's our goal, and uh, our hope is that all of them do. We saw during the pandemic that some difficult decisions needed to be made. However, we saw that many, many organizations who were willing to make those kinds of difficult decisions did thrive, and we see several of those organizations still uh, happening today. In fact, I'm really proud to say that we didn't have any organizations that closed during the pandemic uh, as a result of your um, good vision to support us. Um, with uh, appropriation from the CARES Act and from ARPA fund. That said, uh, we've supported BlackRock since its inception, and uh, we've seen over the years that they have had several issues um, that we have supported them with. We want to support them again this year. And although we don't support um, the, uh, the idea of earmarks and supplemental appropriation, we do understand that at times organizations reach a certain threshold where they need additional support, and we see that with BlackRock. All we're asking for today is that um, the County Council uh, remain uh, committed to its resolution 18-1298, which was adopted in 2018, and that funds for this supplemental appropriation come through the Arts and Humanities Council. Why would I say that? Because we recently funded them, both with general operating support and with funding for their new strategic plan. What we've seen in the past is that money alone does not solve organizational problems when we see these kinds of conflicts, challenges with budget, that kind of thing, staffing. You know, a new strategy is needed, and it's very clear from our colleagues at BlackRock that they are looking at a new strategy. Our hope is that if the funding were to come through Arts and Humanities Council, as it's done before when we've gotten supplemental um, appropriations for other organizations, say, like National Phil, we come up with a strategy and a plan that allows them to access the funds once they've been, been able to enact their certain strategies, and we walk that walk along with them. We've seen great success with organizations by doing it, it this way, and we hope that this kind of plan would really support BlackRock's desires to evolve into something else, whether that's a civic organization, an arts and civic organization, or something completely different. We want to support that, but we want to support it with strategy. Our funding for their strategic plan should help us do that together with them and to help them move forward as they need to um, uh, as a hub for up County. Thank you very much for considering our request. Thank you. Our next speaker is Catherine Matthews. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm glad to see everyone. My name is Catherine Matthews, and I'm here today as uh, a resident, um, a former board member of Black Rock, and a former Up County Regional Services Director. Um, and I do support this proposed supplemental uh, appropriation of number uh, number 2467 for Black Rock. Um, I'm sure you all know that BlackRock has been an important asset to residents, visitors, companies, um, community organizations, and the county government since its doors opened in 2002, 22 years ago. At the time, a former official said, what's important is that we're providing a cultural arts center for the up county, and it will help build up Germantown <coughs> Town Center, and that it has to a point. A group of residents saw an opportunity to realize their vision for a vibrant town center, and they made sure that Black Rock was intentionally located, so it would be that presence that identifies a center of activity. Through the years, Black Rock's staff and board have been ready at each stage of the community's development with accessibility, programming, and support, elements that you find in a healthy community. While I served as the Up County Regional Director, Black Rock supported me many times in my efforts to reduce tensions uh, and bring 
leaders from different factions of the community together for special moments, such as when we gathered for the 9-11 tragedy in 2001. With their outdoor stage equipment and staff, BlackRock was there to support us. As Germantown became known as the youth capital of the county between 2000 and 2010, there was a need for creative partnerships and programming for children and youth. BlackRock took care of that. New businesses started to arrive in, in Germantown at that time, and they needed an attractive facility to host conferences and to entertain their colleagues. BlackRock was there for them. County government needed a suitable facility north of Rockville in order to engage large groups of residents in town hall, at town hall events, planning meetings, and county celebrations like Juneteenth. BlackRock has been there for you. And more recently, BlackRock staff assumed a new role and facilitated a successful uh, social experiment when it transferred into or transformed into an emergency food collection and coordination hub during the COVID pandemic. Again, BlackRock was there for the community. The organization has grown with the community and our children, seniors, and families expect it to be there for them, a place where they can discover and explore the arts and learn more about each other. And I know that you see the value in all this, so I ask you to continue your longtime support of BlackRock by approving this funding request. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you, and thank you for your continued service to the community. Our next speaker is Katie Hecklinger. Good afternoon, President Friedson, Vice President Stewart, and esteemed members of the Montgomery County Council. My name is Katie Hecklinger, CEO of Black Rock Center for the Arts, and I am here today with a sense of urgency to advocate and ask for your support of Supplemental Appropriation 2467 of $260,000 to Black Rock, critical in ensuring the continuation and vitality of this invaluable institution. We are engaged in a highly participatory strategic planning process to understand how Black Rock can best serve the community in a sustainable way. The appropriation funding provides a bridge to a Black Rock that thrives as it responds more directly to what our diverse and dynamic community needs, wants, and expects from Black Rock. Our initial work on this strategy centers in racial equity as a center pillar of our work alongside access to the arts. Black Rock has grown with Germantown as its city center, where the intended economic development and growth intended never came to fruition. However, Black Rock stands strong as the only institution of its kind in Northern Montgomery County. Black Rock is the unincorporated city's town hall and its civic center. We are dance parties and summer markets on the lawn. We are painting pumpkins and costume parades for little ones in October. We are a clean bathroom and water fountain for the homeless. We are high school choirs and sing-alongs in December. We are home and the backyard to the largest populated city in Montgomery County and the second most diverse community in the country. In a few weeks, we will become home to Greenfest as it seeks an up-county location for the first time and the first ever pit stop in Germantown will be held on Bike to Work Day. We also have an exciting work ahead with $1.2 million state bond to revitalize the outdoor space, which will benefit all of Montgomery County residents. This is just the beginning. I urge you to recognize the urgency of this request and to prioritize the well-being of Black Rock Center for the Arts. Without this funding, we are facing the stark reality of furloughs and staff cuts that would severely hinder its ability to deliver community and place-making programs in Germantown and for Montgomery County. Your support is integral in safeguarding the future of our community for generations to come. I thank you for your time and attention. Thank you. Our next speaker is Paula Ross, who also is speaking to item five. So if you'd like, you can take five minutes to speak to both. Thank you. <clears throat> Good afternoon, Council President Friedson and members of the County Council. Thank you for the opportunity to share the Gaithersburg Germantown Chamber's support for supplemental appropriation 2467 in the fiscal year 24 operating budget for Black Rock Center for the Arts. My name is Paula Ross. I'm the President and CEO of the Gaithersburg Germantown Chamber of Commerce. Black Rock is a valued member of the Chamber and an important partner in our Chamber's community engagement programming in the Up County. Black Rock sits in the town center of Germantown, and while it is an incredible hub for arts and culture experiences and education, it is so much more than that. 
Black Rock has grown to be the community gathering center in the Up County. When the council needs a space to conduct a town hall in the Up County, they call Black Rock. When the chamber needed a place in Germantown to host a coffee with a cop event to convene residents and public safety officials for important conversations, Black Rock offered its space. When there is a need in the community, Black Rock opens its doors, such as during the pandemic when the center became a hub for food distribution to those community members in need. Community groups convene at Black Rock for meetings. Neighbors gather at Black Rock to share a movie on the lawn or to see Santa. The business community comes together with neighbors at Black Rock at markets held on the lawn during the, we during the nice weather. You might know that the GGCC will be conducting a feasibility study in Germantown Town Center, the goal of which is to assess the viability of creating a sustainable business improvement district or an urban district. Black Rock is at the heart of that plan, both as a geographic partner and an economic development convener. Black Rock will help us bring the business community and residents together in support of the economic development that was planned in Germantown but never yet realized. I was a leader in the arts nonprofit community for nearly a decade, and I know firsthand how difficult it is to run a nonprofit arts organization. Uh, um, add in the layers of programming and resources needed to be the community convener, host, and civic partner, and reaching for sustainability becomes ever more difficult. I urge you to support this supplemental appropriation for BlackRock. I know Katie and her team are willing to roll up their sleeves to strategically plan a sustainable future for BlackRock, and that future must be couched in a sustainable plan for the town center, which is where we are willing to roll up our sleeves and help as well. Your support safeguards our town center as BlackRock plans its evolution to serve our community in all the ways we've come to expect. I'm also here to speak about the jobs initiative. The reality, um, well, we're here to speak in support of the jobs <laughs> initiative um, for the special appropriation to the, to the operating budget. Um, the reality is that we often hear from business owners that it is tough to do business here in Montgomery County, that it's tough to grow here, that it, and to, tough to grow roots here. Um, that perspective is realized in jobs data. We have 25,000 fewer jobs than we had in Montgomery County just four and a half years ago. The jobs initiative is a statement to our employers and our neighbors that we want to strive for competitiveness. We want to reestablish Montgomery County as an economic force in the region. This initiative will incentivize employers to create multiple high paying jobs here in the county. It will set up an innovation fund similar to those found at several regional neighbors, including Fairfax, Arlington, and DC. It will support investment in and programming support for entrepreneurs from underserved communities and Montgomery County equity focus areas. Several of those equity focus areas are within the service area of the GGCC in Gaithersburg, Germantown, and Montgomery Village. Our chamber's goal will be to work as a partner with you to serve these growing businesses along the upper I-270 corridor through this program, and we stand ready to help. We urge the council's support of the jobs initiative and the special appropriation to make it realized. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thanks, everybody, for joining. You came in under budget there. Uh, we're going to turn to our one virtual speaker for this item, William Roberts. You have three minutes when you're ready. Thank, thank you. Uh, thanks, Council, uh, Council President Friedson uh, and members of the Council for the opportunity to speak with you today. I'm William Roberts. I'm a Clarksburg resident, a former chair of the Up County Citizens Advisory Board, and a current BlackRock board member. I'm glad to be here today in support of the proposed supplemental appropriation uh, for the Black Rock Center for the Arts uh, and the FY24 operating budget. I'm going to associate myself with uh, comments that have been made in support already from uh, some of my friends on the panel. Uh, Black Rock is indeed the beating heart of Germantown, to be sure, and it's also a critical anchor uh, for the entire Up County, connecting uh, folks who visit, visit our region with uh, businesses, community organizations, and our residents all together. Uh, I'm proud to serve on the board. I've been proud to be associated with the various programs and activities that uh, Black Rock has to offer to enrich the civic life of our communities. Uh, I often think about Black Rock's facilities, the, the outdoor stage, it, uh, the uh, indoor facilities as well, as part of our uh, regional public square, right, in the same way that some of the offerings um, and events held down at Veterans Plaza tie together important parts of the down county or things that are held in Rockville Town Center tie together the mid county. That's what you get at Black Rock, as you've heard uh, from folks this afternoon. It's a place where you can take in an amazing performance and uh, enjoy beautiful works of art, but also where the community comes together for important celebrations like Juneteenth to bring your kids to amazing uh, summer camps or to the Little Pumpkins Festival, but also a place where we come together to join 
uh, hearts and hands as we address really serious issues like the scourge of gun violence in our community and the place that has incubated uh, the Up County hub as uh, Kathy spoke to. That is BlackRock. Uh, and I dare say if it didn't exist, this current group of folks and a lot more people up county would be in chambers today asking for you to help create it. Uh, and so, uh, as has been said before, we know that you know the uh, importance of Black Rock and the centrality of it to the community. And I trust that you'll understand the importance of, uh, of what your support will do for its continued vitality and success. So I urge you to support the supplemental and thank you very much. Thank you for your testimony. Thanks, everybody, for joining us today for this item. This public hearing is now closed. We're going to move on to item five. This is a public hearing on special appropriation to the FY24 <laughs> operating budget, Montgomery County Government, Department of Finance, Economic Development Fund, New Jobs Initiative, $20 million. The source of funds is general fund undesignated reserves. A joint government operations and fiscal policy and economic development committee work session is currently scheduled for April 29th. Those wishing to submit material for the council's consideration should do so by the close of business on April 22nd. Each registered speaker has three minutes to speak. We'll start with Rich Maddalino on behalf of the county executive. And as others join the table, CEO Maddalino, when you're ready, you have three minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. President, members of the committee for the record, Rich Maddalino. I'm the chief administrative officer for the county government. Uh, uh, many of you probably saw in today's poll from Goucher College that 57% of the residents of, the, of Montgomery and Prince George's counties believe that we are in the right track, the highest in the state. 56% believe that we have a mostly positive economic outlook, by far the highest in the state. Yet 80% of respondents said jobs and economic development are the number one issue facing um, the Montgomery and Prince George's region, by far the number one category. Since his first days in office, the county executive has been very clear that economic development is very important and essential to him. He knows, as you do, that jobs provide opportunities for people to live here. People who live here and work here, companies that are here, employers that are here, provide tax revenue that help do all the things he wants to do, you want to do on behalf of our, of our residents. From the earliest days in the administration, he partnered with Council Member Katz on a listening tour with the business, business community, trying to say, tell me what regulations do we not need? Tell me what changes we need to do to be an economically competitive and uh, hospitable place. He has put in $47 million in the budget this year for economic development in both the operating budget and the capital budget. Um, including money for the biohub in Maryland, including $7.5 million for a small high growth um, business fund. But what maybe um, you don't know with the budget, and we haven't really had the budget, the public hearing on the budget yet, from when we were before you in December with a fiscal update to now, our revenue outlook for FY24 has changed. The closeout for tax year 22 actually showed us losing um, ground with our, with our surplus. So while we are still at a record amount of money in excess reserves, um, we are lower than where we thought we would be. And so the county executive, who very much appreciates the ideas that the council president and many of you have put forward with these funds, do that as part of the FY25 budget for us all to work together to come up with a framework like the three funds the council president has suggested, the one fund that the county executive has presented, which are very similar, but to do it within what we look, what we can tell is our framework for FY25. And so therefore, because you didn't have that information when you were putting it together, uh, the county executive very much wanted to put $100 million in affordable housing, only put $65 million. He wanted to put $25 million into economic development funds. He was only to, able to put $7.5 for um, for FY25, so we still have some revenues, we um, surplus revenues. That's all worked together to figure out what is the best approach for us moving forward with these various funds. And of course, myself, Ken Hartman Espada, who you thankfully confirmed um, as the assistant CEO, 
and the rest of the executive branch are happy to work with you, with the chair of the Economic Development um, Committee, with the chair of the Environment and Transportation Committee, with the chair of the Education and Culture Committee, because you all play an important role in um, economic development. And of course, the chair of the Government Operations Committee pulling it all together in a balanced approach. So very much appreciate your time, uh, Mr. President, and the a little added time that you that you gave me because, of course, um, we greatly uh, appreciate your assistance. Thank you for your testimony. Our next speaker, Ali Williams. Council President Friedson, Council Vice President Stewart, and esteemed Council Members. Okay, we go. Okay. Council President Friedson, Council Vice President Stewart, and esteemed Council Members, I am Ali Williams, President and CEO of the Greater Bethesda Chamber of Commerce, and as of yesterday, a 98-year-old business organization made up of 600 members, where our mission is to support, inspire, and advocate for business to better our community. I sit before you today to emphasize the critical importance of nurturing a healthy economy within our beloved county. As we all know, a thriving economy serves as the lifeblood of our community, driving growth, prosperity, and opportunity for our residents. In recent years, Montgomery County, like many jurisdictions nationwide, has encountered economic challenges that demand innovative solutions. In response, we wholeheartedly support the launch of the Jobs Initiative, a pivotal step toward addressing these challenges head on and propelling us toward a brighter future. And we wish to thank the nine council members who co-sponsored this most important initiative. Developed in close collaboration with our esteemed Montgomery County Economic Development Corporation, the Jobs Initiative comprises three distinct yet interconnected initiatives, the Jobs Fund, the Innovation Fund, and the Equity Fund. The Job Fund provides a significant incentive for employers to offer high paying jobs and attract talented workers to the county. The Innovation Fund will fuel innovation and propel groundbreaking technologies into the marketplace, helping small businesses from underserved communities navigate the most challenging aspects of growth, gaining access to much needed capital. By providing financial support to small businesses in equity focused areas, the Equity Fund embodies our county's steadfast commitment to racial equity. It will reduce barriers to entry and pave the way for diverse entrepreneurs to thrive. In essence, the Jobs Initiative represents a bold and strategic investment in our county's economic vitality. By attracting businesses, fostering innovation, and championing equity, we set the stage for enduring prosperity and shared success. And let's not forget that investments in our economy will yield results that benefit all county residents in the future. The jobs proposal will add to our tax base, making the county more attractive to our target industries, attract a talented workforce with higher paying jobs, give a boost to ancillary businesses and add greater revenue for the county services, avoiding tax and fee increases. We eagerly anticipate collaborating with the MCEDC and fellow stakeholders to realize the full potential of the jobs initiative. And for these reasons, we ask the council to support this important program to usher in a new era of economic growth and opportunity for Montgomery County. Thank you all for listening and the chamber appreciates your hard work. Thank you. Our next speaker is James Walters. Members of the Montgomery County Council, esteemed colleagues and fellow residents, my name is James Walters, founder of Avos Bioenergy and Avos Biogen. First and foremost, I want to express my wholehearted support for the new jobs initiative. The special appropriation has the potential to catalyze economic growth, foster job creation, and propel innovation in Montgomery County. I am deeply grateful for the noble efforts in creating a conducive environment for businesses to excel. I want to express gratitude for the inspiration drawn from events like the Committee for Montgomery 2023 Legislative Breakfast, where I was moved by the initiatives and sustainability and the commitment to bring innovation and AI to the county. Today's appropriations answer that call. We have heard sobering statistics in our economic lag behind the region and urgent need to reverse this trend. But instead of dwelling on them, you have seized this moment to enact bold, transformative measures that will set us on a new trajectory. The initiatives outlined in this proposal are precisely the kind of strategic investments we need to rejuvenate our local economy. The Job Creation Fund will attract new businesses and encourage existing ones to expand, fostering economic growth. 
the Innovation Fund aligns perfectly with our vision at AVOS to hire to harness AI powered biotechnology for ecological restoration and sustainable energy and healthcare production during land reclamation and wastewater re remediation. And the Equity Fund resonates deeply with our commitment to equity, inclusivity, and student led empowerment for economic and equitable opportunity. Allow me to share a glimpse of our endeavors for your special appropriation that can, that can empower. At AVOS, we pioneer carbon negative technologies and create pathways towards sustainable closed loop economics. Our team brings over 25 years of experience in healthcare, energy, and AI industry, further bolstering our capabilities and driving meaningful innovation. We leverage renewable resources and innovative technologies. We address environmental challenges and create economic opportunities for the community through validated carbon and renewable offsets. The Council's commitment to innovation and job creation has directly inspired for forging partnerships with Howard Jean, member of the Board of Advisors for the Universities at Shady Grove, and our collaborations extend to AI-powered education initiatives with Ahura AI, a leader in their field, whose CEO and co-founder Brian Talibi was raised right here in Rockville. In addition, our collaborations with other AI companies such as Digital Gaia, led by the former managing director at, at the Rocky Mountain Institute, and their collaboration with System AI underscore our commitment to forging partnerships that transcend boundaries and bring collective progress to Montgomery County in direct response to the call to action that the special appropriation like this empowers. But beyond innovation, this appropriation encompasses and inspires community empowerment. It enables collaborative paid internships, advisory partnerships, and research endeavors. And this will nurture a workforce that reflects the diversity and dynamism of Montgomery County. So I want to express my heartfelt gratitude to the Council for your leadership in championing equity, innovation, and economic development. As a local resident, a business owner, and a passionate advocate for change, I stand ready to work alongside of you to turn this vision into reality. Your initiative empowers our sincere desire to collaborate with Montgomery County officials to learn from your experience, your expertise, and to contribute to the realization of our shared goals. Our mission is not just about building successful business. It's about building an, empower featuring, uh, an empowering future for the county, one where economic prosperity is intertwined with social equity and environmental stewardship. In closing, I want to reiterate my wholehearted support for the New Jobs Initiative and reaffirm our commitment to collaborating with Montgomery County officials and stakeholders to drive meaningful change and usher a new era of prosperity for our community. Thank you for your time, dedication, and unwavering commitment to building a brighter future. Together, let us continue to innovate, collaborate, and create a legacy that will endure for generations to come. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Brian Levine. Uh, good afternoon, Council President Friedson, Vice, Vice President Stewart, and members of the County Council. I am Ryan Levine with the Montgomery County Chamber of Commerce, and thank you for allowing me to testify today in support of the $20 million special appropriation to the FY24 operating budget for the Jobs Opportunities and Business Support Initiatives. The Chamber applauds the sponsor, Council President Friedson, and the co-sponsors of the special appropriation for coming up with this initiative, uh, which we firmly believe is a very smart use of one-time revenues for a very important purpose. Uh, in all honesty, we wish that we had thought of this one uh, ourselves, or at least I do. Um, we are so pleased that the uh, Montgomery County Economic Development Corporation is going to be administering these funds, um, and we have a tremendous amount of faith that MCEDC will do a great job um, managing that these programs. Um, I think what we were most impressed with when we initially learned of the initiative was uh, what it targets. It's job creation, it's innovation-focused industries, it's equity-focused economic development. Um, we would not change a thing, um, and we have no doubt that your jobs initiative will be successful in incentivizing new economic growth <coughs> excuse me, and job creation across the county. Uh, in our estimation, the jobs initiative will have other impacts as well. Uh, creating and funding these economic development tools also helps the county's economic competitiveness and business climate uh, just by its mere existence. Uh, this sends an important message that, count to count that county leaders, such as yourselves, uh, are focused on creating equity-focused economic activity and good-paying jobs right here in Montgomery County. Uh, the Chamber, as you can imagine, thinks that the best way to grow the tax base in Montgomery County is to increase economic opportunities. And that's exactly what Council President Friedson's special appropriation and creation of these funds will do. Uh, it is for these reasons that we support the Jobs Initiative and ask the Council for unanimous support of this uh, special appropriation. Thank you. 
Thank you. Our final speaker on this item is Stephanie Helsing. Good afternoon, um, Council President Friedson, Vice President Stewart, and esteemed members of the Council. Um, for the record, my name is Stephanie Helsing, and I'm the President and CEO of the Greater Silver Spring Chamber of Commerce, which represents more than 300 employers, most small and minority-owned businesses in Greater Silver Spring and surrounding areas in Montgomery County. First, on behalf of the Chamber, I want to thank again the Council for recognizing the overall importance of economic development and, in and investing in jobs. A $20 million commitment to growing 1,000 jobs will pay dividends long into our county's future. We also believe that promoting commerce and economic development is everyone's job. I'm going to speak a little bit more personally about what this initiative means for Silver Spring. Um, Silver Spring, like other communities in our county, has faced challenges to its economy brought on by the pandemic and the subsequent changes in our workforce habits. A lack of boots on the ground, the closing of businesses, loss of jobs has hurt our local business and our general economy. The mission of the Silver Spring Chamber is to widen opportunities by growing jobs and businesses to increase prosperity for all of our residents, and the jobs initiative is just what is needed. A major challenge we continue to face is the high vacancies in our downtown office market. Attracting new companies and fostering business expansion for existing companies is vitally important. The jobs initiative will help jumpstart local economies like Silver Spring with new high paying jobs and help to revitalize our downtown. The special emphasis on the county's equity focus areas will definitely benefit Silver Spring by giving a boost to our entrepreneurs, businesses, and enticing entrepreneurs and innovators to call Silver Spring their home. In summation, the chamber wants all businesses to succeed. And we believe that this initiative begins to address some of the challenges being faced by Silver Spring businesses. Business growth and development is ultimately the key to a thriving community, a thriving Silver Spring, a thriving Montgomery County, and a thriving Maryland. This is one more step that allows Silver Spring to take its rightful place as a business and residential hub and an economic engine in the county for those who live here, who work here, and who come to enjoy the wonderful amenities that we have to offer. Thank you again to the Council for understanding this and taking action to address it. The Chamber agrees with a statement that was recently published um, in the Sentinel, I believe, where Council President Friedson said, Montgomery County is open for business and Montgomery County is open to business. And I believe that this initiative will help ensure that. I look forward to working hand in hand with the Council and the MCEDC on this initiative. And we really hope that this gets through. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'll just note that I was quoted quoting Councilmember Mink. So I just, for full attribution here, I uh, I was quoted quoting. So I was I, quoting somebody else. I don't yeah, remember yeah. who it was, but so in, whoever in, it was, in, thanks. In, in, in fairness, but appreciate it. Thank you, everybody, for joining. We have no other speakers who are uh, scheduled to testify on this item, so that public hearing is now closed. We're now going to move on to item number six. On our agenda, this is a public hearing on Supplemental Appropriation 2440 to the FY24 Operating Budget, Montgomery County Government, Montgomery County Fire and Rescue Services, IFF COVID booster vaccinations in the amount of $134,190. The source of funds is undesignated fire fund reserves. A joint government operations and fiscal policy and public safety committee work session is currently scheduled for April 8th. Those wishing to submit material for the Council's consideration should do so with the end of business today. Each registered speaker has three minutes to speak, but there are no registered speakers for this hearing. So this public hearing is now closed. Moving right along, we're now gonna move on to item seven. The council will now sit as the district council to take action on two items. The first action item is the Tacoma Park Minor Master Plan Amendment. Uh, we have talked in great detail about this uh, item. We've had a number of work sessions, both in the uh, Planning, Housing, and Parks Committee uh, on, uh, 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 you know, throughout the last uh, uh, few months, uh, April 12th, uh, excuse me, March 12th and, and 19th, um, uh, 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 most recently, um, and uh, we're here at the full council. Uh, uh, so um, I'll turn it over to staff if uh, you have any comments we've already gone through and summarized all of the items uh, so I'll turn it over to the uh, district vice, uh, district council member and vice president uh, for some comments I can make up some uh, wrapping up comments and um, if there are colleagues who wish to speak on this uh, please put yourself in the queue and then we'll move on to a roll call vote 
Great. Um, I just want to, I've spoken to this a number of times, and I just want to extend my thanks to the people involved um, at the city and county level and for the many residents who provided input and feedback uh, on the plan throughout this whole process. Um, the plan, as amended by the Planning, Housing, and Parks Committee, makes recommendations to improve quality of life, guide future development, and encourage improvements to the natural and built environments within the plan area. Um, again, I just want to thank the uh, Planning, Housing, and Parks Committee for all their work on it. I was glad to be um, in those work sessions. Um, and I just want to thank uh, Ms. Dunn for her careful, careful read of this, because I do think the recommendations that came out and the discussions in the PHP committee um, made uh, what was a great plan coming from the Parks Department and the um, Planning Department and Board uh, an even greater one and better one for our community. So thank you for your due diligence on that. Um, you know, the revisions that uh, we looked at included removing language that recommended the city modify its rent stabilization policy, we increase the percentage of MPDUs to 15%. Um, there's an inclusion of a no net loss definitions and adjustment to building heights along Maple Avenue. And I think all of those um, really helped improve the plan. And again, I just want to give my thanks to uh, the planning department staff um, who worked on this um, for the last four years. Um, you know, I know when this plan was started uh, and we discussed it because I was the mayor in the city of Tacoma Park. And I'm very glad to be here today as the district council member to vote in favor of it. So thank you, everyone. Well, thank you having you here as the district council member, as the former mayor and working so closely with the city of Tacoma Park, I think has been a really great model uh, here and something that I hope we can replicate in uh, other uh, areas and other opportunities. I'll just say that the Tacoma Park Minor Master Plan Amendment, I think, is a blueprint for making a great community even better and ensuring that more people have access to it. I'm very proud of the work that we have done at the Planning, Housing, and Parks Committee and also at uh, the Council to prioritize affordable housing, to foster new investments, to engage public open space, and to connect current and future residents to jobs, housing, and recreational opportunities. The Council took special care to make sure that engagement with the community was robust and led to recommendations that embody racial equity and social justice principles. In 2019, the Council passed a bill that requires the Planning Board to consider racial equity and social justice impacts while preparing master plans, and I believe that the Planning Department has really taken to those commitments and has really uh, implemented uh, an approach that, that works very hard uh, on those uh, issues. Uh, as well. Uh, the plan prioritizes existing residents, includes a wide diversity of housing types, preserves a number of affordable housing units, and proposes development of new housing with inclusive affordability, something that uh, is a real need uh, in every community in Montgomery County, including in Tacoma Park. Uh, it also contains recommendations that will preserve and protect the environment, particularly in the Sligo Creek watershed, which is something that I know is deeply important to residents of Tacoma Park, but also incredibly important uh, to the broader community and to our regional environmental sustainability objectives. So uh, with that, I'm very uh, excited to uh, finally be moving this forward after a long and uh, exhaustive process. And so unless there are any colleagues, which I don't see any, I will ask the roll to be called. Okay, I will uh, call for a hand up. All those in favor, please raise your hands. Just raise your hand, any. Okay. All right, any opposed? No opposed? That uh, passes unanimously. Thank you. Our next item for district council session is Zoning Text Amendment 2401, how, uh, Household Living, Civic and Institutional Uses. The Planning, Housing, and Parks Committee recommends approval with. Uh, amendments. I will uh, just say here that uh, before I uh, turn it over again to uh, the Council Vice President, uh, who I was just very pleased to work together with, want to thank her for all of her leadership on this, all of the efforts that she undertook. I really thank in particular Paul and Cecily on her team and Cindy uh, on my team. Thank uh, Ms. Nadu on, on, on Council staff. 
uh, who was an incredible resource uh, to us. Uh, and uh, this is just, uh, you know, I think a really important next step as we address the housing crisis, when we think about how do we leverage every tool at our disposal, how do we partner with all of our mission-based organizations, with everybody in our community who wants to be part of the solution uh, rather than uh, p p potentially being part of uh, the problem and recognizing that when you're in a, a crisis like we are in the housing crisis, uh, we can't solve this with one tool, we can't solve this with one group, uh, we have to bring together and leverage every resource uh, and every uh, institution and organization in our community uh, in order to, to address uh, these uh, issues. And uh, partnering with faith-based and private educational institutions will unleash untapped resources and surplus land that we otherwise wouldn't be able to access, uh, that would otherwise not go to their highest and best use, would not be able to support the shared mission and public priorities uh, and public policy goals uh, that we have. It's a moral imperative and an economic necessity to ensure that we have sufficient housing in Montgomery County for all of the residents that we currently have and those that we want to attract uh, here. It's a win-win for our community, for our faith-based and educational organizations in the county, and just very grateful for uh, all of our faith-based partners, for uh, organizations like Action in Montgomery, Montgomery for All, and so many other uh, organizations who, who came to the forefront. And I just think that this is yet another example of how we can collaborate and work together to make meaningful progress on some of the most vexing challenges that we face, uh, including with the uh, housing crisis. And I will say, as we spoke about earlier in the passage of the $20 million appropriation for the Nonprofit Preservation Fund, uh, this really demonstrates how we can move the ball forward on some of our most important priorities uh, through the power of partnership when county government works together uh, with local community-based organizations to address these issues and these challenges uh, together. So uh, with that, let me turn it over uh, to uh, Vice President Stewart uh, for comments here as well with my thanks for all of her leadership. Great. Well, um, thank you very much, Council President. Um, Ms. Nadu, thank you uh, for all your work on this. Um, you know, I, when we first uh, approached Council President uh, talking about this issue, um, I was warned that a zoning text amendment <laughs> takes time, <laughs> and uh, it certainly did. This was um, a process. It was brought to us by members of the community um, who uh, were looking to forward their mission um, in the community and had excess land. And they talked to us about the challenges that they face in moving forward. And um, when I say we really rolled up our sleeves on this one, um, I don't mean that figuratively. Uh, we really did. And I want to thank um, my staff, uh, Cecily and Paul, and working with Council President Friedson's office, with his chief of staff, Cindy, um, and the community members. Um, AIM was mentioned, Montgomery for All, um, Pastor uh, Will Ed Green, and many others who provided um, input on this and support along the way. Um, this is really a coming together of members of our community to look for another tool to address our affordable housing crisis. And I think as we do really well here in Montgomery County, when we come together with our residents, with our advocacy groups, with our nonprofits, that is the way that we're going to solve all problems. And I think this uh, FAITH ZTA, our Facilitating Affordable, Inclusive, Transformational Housing, is a great example of that. So I just want to thank all my colleagues, thanks the PHP committee, and look forward to passing this one and seeing what great projects come out of it. Here, here. Okay. Uh, really appreciate it. I don't see any colleagues uh, wishing to speak. So we have a committee recommendation before us for approval for ZTA 2401, the uh, FAITH ZTA. Madam Clerk, could you please call the roll? Council Member Lukey? Yes. Council Member Lukey votes yes. Council Member Mink? Yes. Council Member Mink votes yes. Council Member Sales? Yes. Council Member Sales votes yes. Council Member Glass? Yes. Council Member Glass votes yes. Council Member Jawando? Yes. Council Member Jawando votes yes. Council Member Katz? Yes. Council Member Katz votes yes. Council Member Albanos? Council Member Albanos is absent. Council Member Fanny Gonzalez? Yes. 
Councilmember Finding Gonzalez votes yes. Councilmember Balcom? Yes. Councilmember Balcom votes yes. Councilmember Stewart? Yes. Councilmember Stewart votes yes. Councilmember Friesen? Yes. Councilmember Friesen votes yes. Okay. Congratulations. Great team effort. Appreciate your leadership. Um, item eight uh, on our agenda we're going to move on to the this is a work session on amendments to the comprehensive water supply and sewerage systems plan water and sewer category change request the transportation environment committee recommends approval with amendments chair glass i will turn it over to you to share the recommendation and turn it over to staff as needed uh, staff will definitely be needed during this conversation <laughs> Uh, 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 thank you, uh, Council President. Um, so water sewer category changes, one of the lesser known but incredibly important aspects of local government. Uh, the t and &E Committee had a very thorough conversation about some, uh, uh, about some uh, category changes. Um, there were 11 of them in total, seven of the applications uh, we agreed with uh, and denied those applications. Um, three of them we expressed our support for with certain conditions, uh, and one application uh, we deferred. Uh, I will turn it over to Mr. Levchenko to walk us through those. Um, some of them are very straightforward. I would, I would uh, venture to say uh, at least eight of them are very straightforward. Uh, and we might engage in, in dialogue on the remaining three, but I appreciate the council president putting this down as a work session so we can work through these items. Mr. Olvchenko. Yeah, and just to clarify, today is a work session. If the council does come to a conclusion today, then we'll bring it back for consent action uh, at our next available meeting. Great. Uh, with that, I, I will note, uh, as you, you started to summarize regarding the um, 11 requests, uh, eight of them are in the Glen Hills study area, and so a lot of the same issues came up with all of them. Uh, six of them were recommended for denial, um, and uh, uh, one was recommended for, or the, the committee recommended denial on six, which was consistent with the county executive and the planning board recommendation. Um, one was recommended for approval, which was also consistent with the um, executive and planning board, and one which we had a little more uh, discussion on was recommended for deferral pending further information because depending on that information there may be uh, uh, one or both properties involved may be eligible under current policies. Uh, so um, with regard to the Glen Hills cases there was a, a lot of discussion about that and there was also a lot of discussion at the planning board and we have folks here from the uh, planning department and planning board here that can speak to that uh, about um, whether the uh, broader issues of sewer in the Glen Hills area and, in fact, the Potomac subregion area should be looked at again. Uh, uh, going back to 2016 and 2017, uh, when the council last looked at Glen Hills comprehensively, uh, they made some changes to the area to um, uh, put it more on par with other areas that are outside the planned sewer service area. Uh, however, there was also an interest at the time of considering uh, a broader look through a limited master plan amendment. Uh, uh, Councilmember Katz will remember this quite well. Um, uh, but the feeling at the time was that the, the council had gone pretty much as far as it could go absent uh, that next step of a uh, master plan amendment to, to look at the area and develop criteria that the council felt at the time it could not go past. Uh, under the current master plan, which dates back to 2002. Uh, so that affected a number of these requests. Basically, if the, if the properties uh, did not have an, a septic failure, uh, which we do have a policy in place for addressing septic failures, if they didn't have a failure uh, and they were not abutting or confronting the planned sewer service envelope, there's really not a policy in place uh, for these individual requests. Uh, so for the ones that were recommended for denial, that was the reason for the, for the denials. For the one recommended for approval, um, it was found to be adjacent to the planned sewer service envelope, so it was consistent with uh, uh, existing policies. And then the deferral will just depend on, on the information we get. 
Uh, so those are the, the um, eight requests that you had mentioned that we might be able to go quickly through. I don't know if there's further discussion the council would like to have on, on the Glen Hills issue in general and well, next well, steps, but uh, those are the eight of the 11 requests. Uh, and I think it would just be important at this point, can you just share briefly the process that a request is made, it goes mm -hmm. to the planning board and oh, so sure. forth, just so uh, we all understand that this has been vetted by sure. many other uh, folks. Yeah, the Department of Environmental Protection, we have staff here from there as well, uh, they receive the applicant requests from the property owners. Uh, they review them internally. They also seek comment from uh, the planning department and WSSC and other departments and agencies as needed. Uh, and once a recommendation is developed through DEP, it then goes to the executive uh, for a formal recommendation that would be transmitted to the council, uh, which it, they were in this case. Uh, at that time, the council requests that the planning board uh, formally review the requests and provide its recommendations, uh, which it has done. Uh, and then it goes to the, the council committee, of, you know, the T&E committee for review and uh, discussion, and then the council. So we do have uh, the planning board's recommendations uh, uh, here. Uh, WSSC Water is also informed, but they, they're more involved in terms of the uh, feasibility and technical aspects of how a property would be served and if there's capacity to serve it, less so on the policy side. And, and so the, the bottom line is that uh, everyone is in agreement on these eight. On these eight, yes. Correct. Uh, I'll turn it back to you, Mr. President. Yeah, thank you. I'll just uh, note as the current, this is one of the few areas mm -hmm. that I actually gained as a district uh, council member. We normally talk about all the areas that I have uh, uh, ceded uh, to my uh, uh, terrific colleagues here uh, to my right on the dais. Uh, but uh, Council Member Katz used to represent Glen Hills for many years. I now represent Glen Hills. This issue has to be resolved, and it is not a tenable situation. And so I just think it's important that we note here, I'm going to defer uh, to the, the committee and uh, you know, to the various levels that have gone through uh, this process, but I don't think that it is a tenable situation in perpetuity to not address what are clearly serious issues with not only quality of life, but health, uh, among uh, among uh, others, you know, I have met with the homeowners in this community. I know Councilmember Katz and his uh, team and his office have have met over over many years. Uh, there have been studies that have been started and stopped. Uh, ultimately, we need to have an approach that addresses it. I am personally very sensitive to using the sewer envelope to expand the footprint and to you know, create sprawl development, which is something that we're trying to avoid and should not be uh, used in that way. It's not an appropriate way for growth to occur. I'm very sensitive uh, to those issues, as the county historically has been, I think with very good reason for environmental sustainability reasons, uh, infrastructure reasons, among others. Uh, but this is not a tenable situation moving forward. So I think that the committee has, you know, appropriately uh, responded uh, here, uh, and I you know, defer to them on, on that based on the recommendations that are before the committee, uh, but do appreciate the planning board's conversation about alternative approaches that need to be addressed because you know, denial here does not solve any problems. Those problems will linger, and they're frankly only going to get uh, uh, more challenging and, and worse. So I just mm -hmm wanted to note that. I will yield yeah. back to you, but I also, uh, we have uh, Council Member Katz in the queue, just so you know. Uh, sure. Uh, I, I appreciate those comments um, and the, the fuzziness to which you alluded. Um, stay tuned for the next three items that are on the agenda. Uh, but uh, during the committee, it was noted that uh, I believe Council Member Balcom and I and, and, and Vice President Stewart was traveling with the county executive. Um, we too share that concern. Um, and uh, I believe we express support for uh, the planning board to come up with a limited master plan amendment. I know it's not currently in the queue, um, but after today's conversation, it might be something worth considering. I know we're now in budget and it's not uh, within one of those budgetary items, but it is clearly something that needs to be addressed. I, I share those comments. 
appreciate that. I think there's agreement there. That's what I was I, mm -hmm. alluding to as well. So I, I appreciate that and the work of the, the committee and all the work that's gone into this. Uh, Councilmember Katz. Thank you very much, Mr. President. And I, too, want to agree with that. This is, did you say it was 2002, Keith? Mm -hmm. Uh, the master plan dates back to 2002. The Glen Hills issues that we most recently took up and made some decisions on were, were in the 2016 2017 time frame. Yeah, and if you believe in the arc, it probably started there as well. But, but I, the, the whole thing, we have got to come up with a solution. And, and once we have, and I believe you need the minor master plan, and regardless of how it ends up, at least we will know that. 22 years ago, you know, we need to look at this again. So I, I think this is the only fair thing to do. I agree with the with the uh, recommendations for this one, but we have to finally come up with an answer, regardless of what it is, to figure this thing out. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you. Uh, okay, continue going through. Uh, yeah. Item. It only gets easier from here. Uh, so oh, yeah. let's take up that uh, ninth one. Yeah, and the, the one other item I wanted to mention before we leave this topic is uh, th there was a discussion about the, and Mr. Uh, Councilman Friedson mentioned this, about studies that have started and stopped in, in the Glen Hills area. Um, there is a policy in the, in the current water and sewer plan uh, to look at broader areas, not just individual properties, but broader areas that are experiencing um, septic problems. And the, the council made some adjustments to that policy uh, once again, we're talking a couple councils ago, uh, that uh, restricted when those areas could be studied and basically required that there be at least one documented failure. Uh, so the, the policy at that point becomes a little bit less proactive than it otherwise would be because you have to have at least one confirmed failure. Uh, so once again, th that policy, which is in the water and sewer plan, that could also be reviewed again by the council. Uh, if, if the council feels that that policy needs to be uh, more proactive or more um, uh, uh, in advance of failures, uh, which is some of the discussion that occurred at the planning board this time around, was the idea that we have a lot of aging septic systems. If you wait for them to fail, then you have another a bit of a time lag between the time when they get addressed and sewer actually becomes available to serve those properties. So that is, that is a fundamental question the council needs to address, perhaps again, is how proactive they want uh, this kind of um, uh, area-wide policy to be uh, going forward. At the time the council decided to limit it, uh, that was two councils ago. I, I don't know uh, where you know this current council might be on that issue if it were to come up. So just wanted to mention that that is something that is in the council's hands that does not require a limited master plan amendment. That would go beyond just the Glen Hills area. That would affect uh, whatever areas outside the envelope there are throughout the county. Uh, so it's a broader policy in the water and sewer plan that could be looked at again. Um, with that, we can turn to the other three requests. Yeah, teed it up. Uh, the deferral, first of all, uh, this property was also in the in the uh, Glen Hills area. Uh, but uh, on first glance, it, it, it appeared not to be consistent because it was uh, not immediately adjacent to the planned sewer service envelope. Uh, there is a vacant sliver of land between it and uh, a, a property that is in the planned area. Uh, however, um, that vacant sliver may in fact be a, um, uh, a public easement at this point. Uh, some more research on that needs to be done. Uh, and also, uh, the, the request actually involved two properties in um, common ownership, and the issue of whether both properties might be eligible or just one also needs to be uh, dealt with. Uh, so staff had recommended deferral pending further information on those two items, uh, and the committee was supportive of that deferral. Uh, thank you for that, Mr. Vyshenko. Uh, essentially, there is a piece of property that the, the county is unsure of ownership and so they are doing some deep research to figure out uh, who owns this property and then that will help uh, allow us to, to make a decision about this. So that's why uh, we are recommending deferral. Let's keep going. No, yeah, yeah, keep going. Right. Okay, the, uh, the last two requests, um, one is the Hearst Ennis Johnson Blackman request. Uh, it's a request to um, develop a property in the um, uh, Travilla area. 
uh, for senior townhouse, or it's a senior townhouse development, pretty significant size development. Uh, the committee had a lot of discussion about this request. Uh, there's several parcels involved and water as well as sewer. Uh, ultimately, the committee was supportive of the uh, development, um, feeling it was consistent with the peripheral sewer service policy. This is uh, a policy unique to the Potomac subregion area. Uh, there was discussion in the committee about the fact that this is it's a bit unusual. Most of the peripheral sewer cases involve um, one or a few properties. Um, uh, typically, um, all, uh, as far as my knowledge, all with single-family homes. In this case, you have a uh, planned townhouse development. Uh, however, the committee was um, supportive of this, uh, recognizing that uh, the, uh, for this development to move forward, it would need a conditional use approval by the hearing examiner, and then ultimately a preliminary subdivision plan approval by the planning board. However, the committee was supportive of at this time approving the category change and allowing those other processes to play out. Uh, so uh, without going into the nuts and bolts, it would, it would um, provide approval of the, uh, of the water of W1 needed for one parcel and the unrestricted sewer service for the other two parcels uh, to allow the rest of these um, review processes uh, to play out. Uh, and Mr. Lovchenko, just for everyone's uh, awareness, when it came to the council, it was originally uh, listed as as uh, disapproval, mm -hmm. correct? Uh, yes, the executive had recommended disapproval, uh, feeling that the uh, uh, the um, uh, scale of the project was not in line with um, typical peripheral sewer service policy cases, as I mentioned. Uh, but the committee felt that it, uh, in, in a plain reading of the peripheral sewer policy, that it was consistent with the policy, although it had not been a typical type of case. So uh, thank you for that. I think it's important for this conversation because essentially this is a, a property that uh, is prime for development. Um, it wants to be developed. There are folks who want to build residential there. The rub is that uh, traditionally uh, it has been, uh, this process has been allowed for single family homes. And what is being proposed are townhomes. And so it is a precedent setting in a way, but at the end of the day, the code says that this is allowed for residential. And the committee decided that residential means residential regardless of the type of homes that are being built. Uh, and if we are consistent in our vision of Thrive and wanting to increase housing, um, residential means residential, and for that reason, the committee recommended approval of this. Well, thank you. I just want to acknowledge and thank the committee for your work on this. I'm glad you overruled the executive recommendation. This is a really important aspect of this uh, 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 piece here. I'll just note a couple things. One, uh, the council did receive supportive testimony from uh, the neighboring association supporting the underlying project that this would uh, allow. Uh, and number two, that the previous council passed a zoning text amendment specifically to allow this type of project in this type of place. So to deny the sewer category change that would allow for the zoning text amendment to produce the type of housing, particularly senior housing, that we don't have enough of, that we desperately want uh, more uh, of, it would be to allow one piece of what is needed but not the other piece and would you know, really be an inconsistency uh, in the uh, public policy priorities uh, of the council. So I, I think, uh, you know, while a bit different than normal uh, sewer category changes that are before DEP and before the committee generally, and I understand you know some of the nuances uh, of that. If you go back to the legislative record here and understand uh, how we actually got to this point, uh, this is a really important one, and uh, it will allow for uh, what is a robust process uh, that they still have to go through as part of this uh, project, but one where the uh, previous council felt very strongly that this was the very type of project we wanted uh, to allow. We wanted to specifically uh, authorize. So I appreciate the work of the committee uh, on that and, and very supportive. Great. Unless there are any comments on that, I'll turn it back over to Mr. Olchenko for the last item. Okay. The last item is a private institutional facilities request. 
uh, in the Olney area. Uh, the property is actually located on Old Baltimore Road uh, off of uh, uh, George Avenue. And uh, the, the applicant is requesting to build a uh, religious institution on the property. Um, water and sewer are both being requested. Uh, the, um, uh, here we had uh, general agreement supportive from the executive, the planning board, and uh, uh, the committee, uh, but with some nuances in terms of what should be uh, part of the conditions of approval or uh, laid out uh, for some instruction going forward for the uh, planning board's review. Uh, and uh, there's a lot of discussion about uh, past council actions with, with private institutional facilities requests. Uh, uh, often these cases have been in areas where there are concerns about imperviousness and the council has um, worked within the, uh, the um, uh, approval of the PIF requests uh, to, uh, with the applicant to uh, identify a specific imperviousness uh, to, uh, that the applicant should work within. Um, uh, and that, that's been something that's been repeated multiple times uh, in, in other cases. Uh, however, in this case, uh, it's a little bit more complicated. The, the, the property um, uh, sits along two different um, watersheds. Uh, one of them, the Hollings River watershed, does have uh, imperviousness recommendations uh, that uh, uh, all the parties agreed uh, should be, um, the, the, the uh, religious institution should follow as well, which is a 10% imperviousness limit. Um, but the, the, uh, the, the other portion of the property is within the northwest branch watershed, uh, and there are, there are no imperviousness limits um, uh, identified for this area. Uh, and the committee was hesitant to um, identify a particular imperviousness uh, here since there was no guidance uh, outside of this case. Uh, so uh, the, the planning board had recommended um, approval of this, but deferring to the council on what the imperviousness limits, if any, should be. Uh, the committee uh, supported the 10% limit in Hollings River, as, as did the planning board, uh, but with the Northwest Branch uh, opted not to support a specific limit. Uh, but instead just encourage the planning board through the preliminary plan process or subdivision plan process uh, to work with the applicant to minimize imperviousness as much as possible uh, while still allowing for the, um, uh, the request as identified in, or as conceptualized in this request to be able to go forward. Uh, so a um, little bit different, both were our uh, approvals conditioned on a future action by the planning board but with slightly different guidance assumed uh, going forward. Uh, thank you for that summation. Uh, essentially, there is a parcel that is looking to be redeveloped in Olney uh, that sits on two watersheds, each of which have their own impervious uh, limits. And the committee uh, did not, uh, decided that the committee was not the uh, best party to make those determinations. Uh, uh, at that point in time, but what we did was we referred back to the only master plan uh, to see what the limits and provisions were there. And according to the only master plan, uh, this redevelopment uh, should be permitted. And we have uh, provided guidance to the planning board to essentially negotiate, if that's the right term, uh, to uh, speak with the those who, who seek to redevelop that area uh, to make sure that they are good stewards to the watershed because ultimately that's what we're looking for. And I'll turn it back to the Council President. Uh, Council Member Bauckham. Um, thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair Glass. Thank you, Chair Glass, for um, laying that out. Uh, and I just want to say thank you to the staff. This was a very uh, difficult nuanced discussion and um, I appreciate your patience in, in helping walk us through what needed to be done and um, I, I feel comfortable where we ended up um, and just for my, for my colleagues, um, we're taking one for the team here <laughs> by, by going through this. I, I have to say that a year and a half ago, I didn't know what a sewer uh, envelope was. Now I could probably draw it on the map, so <laughs> there you go. 
Welcome to the County Council. It's great. Um, okay, I don't see any other colleagues. Uh, Mr. Chair? Uh, yeah, I just uh, thank you, Councilmember Balcom, for that. Uh, I think it's fair to say we actually enjoyed the process. We are gluttons for punishment in that regard. Uh, but I do want to thank DEP and planning as well. Uh, it, it was a very thorough conversation, um, and we have direction moving forward that we are committed to building more housing in Montgomery County. And that means uh, providing the utility services to allow those developments to occur. Uh, and hopefully we can talk at another time, whether it's budget or at the PHP committee or somewhere else, about looking at this limited uh, minor master plan uh, to uh, settle some of these issues once and for all, or at least for the next 20, 20 years, uh, and uh, look forward to that conversation. But thank you, and Mr. Lovchenko, as always, uh, thank you for, for walking through this, this discussion. And so you have a, you have a committee recommendation. Uh, oh, yes. Uh, this is Jamie Pratt for the record. There was also one case in the Upper Rock Creek watershed that hasn't been um, yeah, that, yeah. mentioned in this hearing, so I just wanted to make sure that was not missed before. Thank you for that, Mr. Pratt. Yeah, that, that was one of the um, denials that was concurred by all parties. But uh, in the planning board letter, there was some discussion about, once again, additional flexibility that may be warranted uh, for uh, uh, requests like that. Once again, there was a senior housing project, um, but there was no policy in place that would uh, support extending sewer to, to serve that property. Uh, one of the policies that, that the prior council approved uh, that uh, the state did not, the commercial sewer service policy, would have provided an avenue, perhaps, for that property to be served. But we don't have that policy in place. Uh, so uh, once again, we're somewhat at a loss. We don't have uh, the tools that we might uh, otherwise want. Uh, to say yes to that particular request. Uh, we can add that on the list of items to address in the future, but all the, the, the properties that uh, uh, we have approved today are grounded mm -hmm. in our policies or in our master plans mm -hmm. or uh, in Thrive, and so, so I appreci appreciate that and look forward to more conversation. Great. Uh, Council Member Sales. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, Mr. Levchenko, can you give me um, some more information on this project, what the timeline is oh, for this 100-unit senior facility? The, uh, the one in Travilla or the one in uh, The in one Upper we just Rock referenced for Upper oh. Rock Creek for it's currently um, a single-family home on the property. And there are plans to build a 100-unit senior right. living facility. Right. In yeah. order to move forward, they would mm -hmm. need uh, public sewer. So without the public sewer, they're they're not going to be able to move forward. They would have to, uh, uh, or the, the council would have to consider alternative policies. Uh, An exception. Uh, well, once again, the challenge we have is mm -hmm. the, the council uh, approves requests, but then they go to the state for final approval. If we don't have a policy in place that would support that approval, we very likely would get a denial from the, from, uh, the Maryland Department of the Environment. Uh, so we do have what we call exceptional policies in the plan, okay. uh, but those policies would have to be revisited. And I mentioned this commercial sewer service policy. Uh, the state, while they did deny it, they said that they would be open to further discussion regarding it. And so uh, DEP staff and council staff have talked about that. Uh, the next step there would be to uh, start to analyze that issue a bit more and identify some of the modifications in that policy that might uh, um, be amenable to the state. And then that would be a, a policy that would have to be approved uh, through a new process through the council. Okay. So does that go back through the T&E committee or? Yeah. If, if, if we were to... Um, bring back a commercial sewer service policy based on uh, further staff work and work with the Maryland Department of the Environment, that would have to come back to the, the committee and the council for its discussion and approval. Yeah, I definitely think this needs to be brought back to the council um, for reconsideration. Uh, the demand for senior living facilities is high, especially in this region, and to replace a single family home with 100 units. Um, you know, it will need this sort of uh, um, support, sewer support. So 
I look forward to that continued conversation. Thank Sounds you. good. Let me turn it to the chair of the committee. Uh, th uh, thank you very much, Councilmember Sales. Uh, I just want to clarify that there are, uh, there have been instances where the committee and uh, the council have supported uh, sewer hookup only to have it denied by the state because we don't have the policies in place. And what it sounds like, and I'll turn it over to planning to confirm this, that that is simply a zoning issue. Mm -hmm. And if, uh, if it is a zoning issue, we could have a conversation about when uh, a master plan, sector plan, or any other zoning changes would, uh, would be needed to support that. But we don't have the authority right now to grant that. So that's why uh, it has not been supported. Yeah. No, to say succinctly, yes, what you said is, is accurate. There would still be the zoning action that would be required uh, at subsequent to this uh, approval or okay. disapproval in this case. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Pratt. Thank you. I don't see any other colleagues wishing to speak. Uh, so the plan is we're going to bring this back next week uh, for a hand vote and approval. Right. Assuming that the, the council has com completed its discussion today and has no further questions or issues, uh, we can finalize the resolution based on today's discussion and have that uh, go to the council uh, via its consent calendar action. That is the plan. Seeing no other comments or questions from colleagues, with thanks to our colleagues in the planning department and planning board and executive branch, we appreciate all of the collaboration. These items take a lot of coordination and collaboration among different departments and agencies, and so we very much uh, appreciate that. Thank you to the committee as well uh, for your work, and thank you for the crash course in sewer envelopes by, uh, yeah, th this is not an area you probably want to get your feet wet, or at least you might want to take a look at why and how and what. Uh, with that, uh, we're going to move on to item nine on our agenda, speaking of our up county west side uh, 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 council member. We're going to move on to item nine, which is an interview of the county executive's nominee for director of the Up County Regional Service Center. We have Ruben Rosario, who is here with us, and I see he is joined by CAO Madalino. As they are joining the table, just say welcome. And Mr. Madaleno, would you like to offer some introductory remarks? Very much so. Thank you, Mr. President, Madam Vice President, members of the council. I am thrilled to be before you um, to present Ruben Rosario as our nominee for the Up County Services Regional Director. You know, when I talked about the supplemental appropriation, I mentioned 57% of people in Montgomery and Prince George's County think we're going in the right direction. Up County Service. Regional services directors help make sure that is the case because they are the connection between the community and so many of our residents. And you know, earlier today we we had a chance to hear from Kathy Matthews, who certainly defined this job for decades. And um, I think she's still here, still here, recognize. Yeah, she is to make sure. Yeah. To make I'll sure just say good scheduling. Well. Yes, yes, to make sure everything goes well. So, um, but. Um, we, you know, we've had outstanding leaders um, in this position. Um, I want to thank Dale Tibbetts for stepping in in an acting role. Hopefully, you'll confirm Mr. Rosario within a week so um, Dale can move on to his other responsibilities. Um, but uh, Mr. Rosario, who you may um, have had a chance to meet, uh, he is a Bronx, New York native. Um, you know, I always feel like I got to throw these things in a Yankees fan um, and uh, came um, down to huh? Uh, We're in the DMV. For I know, <laughs> I know. But but, you know, there are there are that's I always want to make sure people know that we are an open environment for our for our employees. We're willing to take people from all walks. So. Um, uh, he is a graduate of the State University of New York at Albany. He came to this area to go to Howard Law School. He went back to New York, but then realized his calling was to be a Montgomery County police officer. He spent 17 years with our police department. He rose to the ranks. His final um, assignment was his captain in the Major Crimes Division. 
He is, has many roots in the up county. Um, he has worked in the up county as a parent. He's very active in sports in the up county. Uh, he is um, excited about coming back to public service in the county because of his dedication to our residents, he's, his dedication to helping communities grow. And I think you will find him to be an outstanding representative for us all in the up county making those connections that are so important to um, the county government and to our residents and on behalf of county executive elrich i respectfully ask your um confirmation for mr rosario well thank you for that welcome thank you for your interest in the job thank you for your service up to this point to our uh community i will just note that it's not like your uh your predecessor who has you know larger than life uh figure and the big shoes to fill is looking over your shoulder in this job, but she's literally looking over your shoulder right now. So uh, I don't know if that's poetic justice, symbolism, or what, uh, but I just wanted to acknowledge uh, that, but we welcome her, thank her for all of her service. She has certainly left a, a significant legacy in the community and one that you know, all of us are thinking about as we determine how we're going to fill this important job in a fast growing and critical part of our community. So Mr. Rosario, I have a few questions for you that I'm going to ask and I'll open it up to colleagues for their questions as well. Let's start with uh, whether you can tell us about your background and qualifications as they relate to this job and explain your understanding of the role of Regional Service Center director uh, in the up county as it relates to the county council now thank yeah. you sir appreciate it thank you council for having me I'm, I'm delighted to be here um so to answer your question um so I, I as you know you just heard i was born in the bronx new york um, my family's from puerto rico um just you know in terms of my background my um, mom and dad separated at a very young age i had a younger sister she was just born uh, my father, let's say, relocated, um, had some other plans, and my mom um, found herself in the Bronx with two children and some, you know, parents and things to help her out. But um, like a lot of people in poor communities, um, you know, which is, you know, my my background in the Bronx, she uh, succumbed to substance use disorder. And I'm saying all this to kind of give you a background as to why, uh, you know, where my passion comes from, because some of the things along the way in my career won't make sense otherwise. Uh, so she succumbed to substance use disorder, and we wrestled with that until I was 17 when she ultimately passed away. Uh, she passed away um, in a very tragic way, very common for, um, unfortunately, people in that situation in my community, but she passed away. And uh, my, you know, my sort of plan for life developed, uh, you know, if you, if you look at this, sort of, if you use a traditional family uh, background, it would say, like, my dad was kind of law enforcement telling me what I wasn't supposed to do. And if I did certain things, there would be consequences on the other end. I had to make good choices. It was, it was kind of that driver. But what I needed answered more than anything else was, okay, that's what I can't do, but what, what can I do, right? What are my real options now? How can I change my circumstance now that so much of my support system has gone away? I do wanna you know, uh, recognize my grandmother though. She filled in and did a great, great job. Never experienced one day on earth without love. So thanks to her. Um, so, um, so for me, that, that sort of, you know, softer maternal, if you will, uh, support came from education. Um, I was able to excel in school all throughout uh, my life pretty much. I went to, I had the good fortune of um, receiving scholarships and going to a prep school, which got me right in line for college. Um, I went to SUNY Albany, as you heard. Um, I considered many majors. I considered economics because back then everyone told me, look, economics and business, you can get paid and you can change your life. So I started that, but that was not a good fit at all. So I switched my major to sociology, which makes sense. Um, I majored in sociology, not sure where I would go from there, but uh, upon graduation, I realized, look, you know, I, I'm going to go back to the Bronx and I still have to do more to equip myself to make a difference, to have, have an impact. So I uh, applied to law school. Uh, I got accepted to Howard Law School, which, as you all know, is a historically black university and a civil rights-based school. Incredibly proud to be a graduate of that school. And there they taught me a ton from the technical advocacy standpoint, um, but, but also just from a development side, just from a how to function, how to um, understand all the complications, all the intricacies that go along with um, keeping society safe uh, and getting the resources 
um, and, and key support systems that society needs, all, all, all that goes into that. Um, so graduated from law school and like everybody else, right, uh, again, I'm not getting a whole lot of advice from family members that had been down this road before. I'm just kind of figuring it out. I compete for a law firm job because that's what everyone does, pays a lot of money, get a job at a law firm, six figures, right out of school, feeling great. Um, started working at a law firm for, I did it for a little over a year, maybe a year, year and a half and realized this is not where I'm supposed to be. In, in full transparency, I felt like I was leaving a part of myself behind. The, the young boy, the young kid that needed someone like me to help them no longer had access to me because I was spending my talent and skills in a space that was not directed toward them. So um, I left the law firm and I accepted, I applied and had the, the great fortune of, of being hired as a Montgomery County police officer. Um, the salary was different. Uh, we'll just call it that. It was a different salary, but it was uh, incredibly rewarding in other ways. Um, learned a ton again. Started in Silver Spring as a patrolman. Um, you know, went through several assignments, plain clothes assignments, narcotics work. Uh, promoted. My supervisory experience was in Rockville. Um, so, uh, you know, learned to be a supervisor there. Did some more narcotics work. And then, uh, and then I moved into man management. I took another test and became a lieutenant. Um, became a manager. And that's where I think a lot of the experience, um, what, I think that's where a lot of my police experience would connect to this role. So, um, you know, I now get tied to larger scale initiatives as a, as a manager, and I'll just tell you three of those um, in my executive career. One was, you know, responding to helping, right, always part of a team, but helping to figure out how to respond to the opioid crisis um, from, you know, from a, from a suppression standpoint, sure, but really prevention and intervention also. Uh, were keys for us. I uh, played a significant part in that. I also played a significant part in helping, uh, again, a team to stand up our criminal street gang unit, which, if you guys remember, there were multiple homicides in the county. You guys funded um, several invest investigator positions, but we had to figure out what to do with those positions. So a uh, great team of people. I was able to be part of that. Um, and, and again, pre you know, prevention, intervention, suppression there. You know, I'm interacting with the schools from an educational standpoint. We're training um, then what we called our school resource officers, of course, not now, but um, training them about things like labeling, things about being responsible with lists and making sure purging requirements are being met and, you know, all sorts of nuances there. Um, and then, uh, you know, working with uh, agencies or organizations like Identity, um, you know, who do a lot of intervention work, building relationships with the community um, and HHS and SUN, uh, they played a pivotal part in that um, as well. Anyway, and then, you know, I would say the third major initiative that uh, I worked on, so it was opioids, it was gangs, and then uh, in my time as the major crimes director or captain of major crimes, um, a lot of the laws changed around um, officer-involved shootings and deaths and things of that nature. So I uh, played a, you know, significant role in, in helping design some of the policies there, share them with executives, and make sure that the teams that I was responsible for, homicide units, were investigating those cases appropriately. So. Um, so I did that, uh, and I felt I felt like you know my service, uh, my my direct line service was at a sort of culmination point. Um, I I then um, decide you know I, I, I as part of my responsibilities I was invited to be the racial um, equity social justice lead for the police department. Um, so I, I really relished that role. I, I, I loved it with all the civil unrest um, that was going on a couple years back surrounding George Floyd and things of that nature. I felt very, very passionate about that topic. I once again heard a little bit of echoes from a younger version of me at the law firm who never had a, what I believed was a, a real equitable opportunity to build relationships that would keep me there and support me. Um, it was just a different time. It was 2000 and. 2003. Um, so uh, went went to a major law firm. Um, I was hired as director of recruiting there, which you know was a hot button issue also with law enforcement. So I figured I'm going to develop some skills there, um, and you know my my work there was to help them recruit as many law uh, I'm sorry attorneys of color as possible, um, really skilled, really capable, and then figure out also how to retain them um, and develop them professionally. Right. So really enjoyed that. Um, but, you know, I was also teaching criminal justice at Mount St. Mary's at the same time. And I've, I've, I've taught for years. I taught implicit bias at our police academy for about a decade. I taught at Montgomery College several years back criminal justice. And um, 
Now I'm the director of the Center for Student Diversity at Mount St. Mary's University and teaching four courses there, um, all in criminal justice, race and policing, um, ethics and policing. I have the challenges of 21st century policing and then criminal law. So that's my resume, um, and now how I connect, I know, sorry, that was just, you know, just trying to give you as much as possible, because there are some people I haven't had the great fortune to introduce myself to. So um, so, so now this position, right, uh, you know, this position I think is a marvelous position when I, um, you know, the, the few times that I've walked into the building um, to be briefed and, and, and be sort of uh, informed by the county executive's office who's done a, who have done a great job, I actually feel somewhat emotional, um, I do, because uh, one of the sort of philosophies that I had to, I believe I had to grab a hold of as a young kid was I had to accept that I was not going to be helped in all the ways that I needed and it was my job to do something about that. I unfortunately feel that I had to accept that at too young an age. Um, I was I was a child and um, it wasn't fair, it, it wasn't good. And I know that I know it's done some damage to me. Um, but the building, the position, uh, so much of what the people that I've met do and what you guys do is a direct rejection of that idea. Um, it's, a, it's a correction maybe is a better way to put it. There are brilliant people who are dedicating themselves to um, delivering, facilitating um, the services, the public services that people like me um, have always needed. And, uh, and now I have an opportunity to be part of that, so I'm really excited. Uh, how it connects with the council, I believe, is another part of the question? Yes. Is that right? I mean, you know, it's impossible to do anything great alone, right? So that part's easy. Um, I understand that the position is a shared resource. I understand that the position is um, dependent upon relationship building and connection. Um, I have to, you know, maybe I get assignments from the county executive's office, but um, really, <laughs> you learn this as a policeman, you take assignments from wherever the need is. Um, if people come to you with their problems, they're actually somewhat complimenting you. They're saying that they believe you have the ability to help them and the desire to do so. So um, my plan is to work collaboratively with, with the council. I, I think we're aimed at the same goals, the same mission, um, and, and, and that's what I would do. Great. Thank you. Uh, if appointed, how would you position this role to work on racial equity and social justice issues? You already touched upon it, but if there's anything you want to add to that particular issue, feel free. I'll go really fast. I'll just say, you know, I, I, I thoroughly believe in the ministry of presence, right? You have to be present with people. They have to see you. They have to feel you. So, um, you know, I plan on being very, very present. I plan on being strategic about um, inviting people who maybe otherwise either weren't invited or don't feel invited or have obstacles to, um, to being able to, to be present, right? So, um, you yeah, know, I really plan on doing that. And the reason I believe that is because I don't think you can properly care for people um, and help them and support them if you haven't shared time to be around them. I just think it's the way we're designed. We, we, we do that experientially. We don't do that intellectually. So, um, so yeah, I plan on working a bunch with Ken to do that as well. Great. Uh, my last question before turning it over to a number of colleagues who are in the queue, are there any potential conflicts of interest of which we should be aware? None that I know of, no. Great. Okay, let me that's turn it one. to colleagues. Okay. My wife is a school teacher in yeah. Montgomery County Public Schools. I don't know if that's a conflict, but that's certainly true. certainly not uh, disqualifying. But appreciate you, you, Thank uh, you. Dis disclosing uh, Thank with you. with the coach uh, there with you. Uh, I'm going to turn it over to the uh, council member from the Upper East Side, uh, Council Member Lukey. <laughs> Thank you, thank you, and, and I think you appreciated my Upper East Side, Upper West Side uh, dichotomy when yes. we met because he is, he's from the Bronx and I'm from New Jersey, so that might be where this came from. Right. And uh, we also chatted because I was a summer associate at the same firm that you mm -hmm. ended up going to work at, and neither right. one of us stayed. Um, right. But we had, a, right. we had a great conversation. Yes. And um, so uh, just want to sort of unpack a little bit further question mm -hmm. you've already touched upon this but um, when I ask the question I mean it more from a nuts and bolts kind of perspective okay. um, as you and I discussed this role obviously has a lot of very public forward-facing components to mm -hmm. it not unlike your work in the police department in many respects but then it also has as you did in the police department a lot of internal education mm -hmm. and um, in in this role it might be external and internal mm -hmm. 
Um, so how do you intend to balance the external, very people-facing portion of this job with the internal coordination between district council members like myself, council member Balcom, council member Katz, and the executive branch of government? Yeah, so um, thank you for your, mm -hmm. for your question, council member. So, um, you know, if I understand the question correctly, you know, I, like I said before, right, I have to be present. I plan on being on the move quite a bit. I plan on being on the phone quite a bit. I plan on being uh, probably on Zoom meetings or Teams, whatever platform we use quite a bit. Um, you know, I think I have to listen to people a lot. Um, I think I have to decipher, uh, maybe filter some of what's shared to identify mm -hmm. the issues that are that are key. Um, I know that, um, you know, part of what I'll be trying to do is identify gaps between what is currently provided and what you know what people need, and uh, I myself, right, can't can't really do that. So mm -hmm. I have to be, you know, forward facing. I would say initially with receiving all the information that I can, right, having an intimate connection. Um, with all of all of those needs, um, I think I then have to be regularly communicative with both, you know, the county executive's office and council. You mm -hmm. um, specifically, right? Um, you know, to share what those things what those things are, right. and then I have to be, you know, good about delivering the message, right? And obviously, one that's consistent with the message that you either have already shared or have shared with me. This mm -hmm. is the way we should go about doing that, right? Yeah, inconsistent inconsistency would be a bad thing, I think. Mm -hmm. Um, so that's that's how I that's how I would plan to do that, and then I think uh, you know the last step in that is making sure that I come back with, you know, an explanation, detailed explanation about the status of our efforts, um, the impact um, that that you know our efforts have had, and and any problems or issues that need to be modified. Great, thank you, thank you, Mr. President. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Next up, uh, Councilmember Mink. Thank you. Thanks very much for putting yourself forward and for your service uh, prior to this point as well. Um, similar to East County, which I represent, the Up County Regional Services Center is not connected to an associated urban district. Mm -hmm. um, and that's relevant here because urban districts have budgets for you know, some capacity for marketing, promotion, special events, those sorts of things. So that means more falls to the regional services uh, centers and directors, of course, uh, in those regions to do more with less when mm -hmm. it comes to you know, place making, community building, those types of things. And I'd be remiss if I didn't give a shout out to East County Regional Services Director Drew Bande, who does an amazing job with that uh, for my district. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, I wanted to ask how you understand your potential role in place making and community building and that type of thing uh, in the Up County area. And if there's anything that you wanted to, to add about your experience, I would assist you in that type of work. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for your question. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I would say, right, like like my my direct experience has been predominantly pub public safety, right? Like you, you shared my resume, you know, my background. Um, if it's a public safety issue, I could talk for longer than we have time for. Um, commercial development is not something that I have spent, you know, two, two decades doing, but I, I know the importance of it. Um, I know that we have good people in place that can help with that. I've already, you know, been had a couple of names shared with me. I know that there are, um, you know, uh, you don't want to use a police term, but task forces, if you will, that have been put together, Destination Montgomery and, and other, other um, well, Destination Germantown, I'm sorry, and other um, collections of people that are focused on that. I do have, you know, my, my tenure at the firm that we both worked at um, was uh, involved commercial real estate. Um, so, you know, I was involved in planning board issues and, you know, applying for variances and zoning rules and uh, things like that. So, you know, I, I'll understand terminology, vernacular, um, you know, some, some of those things. But I think, you know, in terms of strategies and things, I'm, I'm going to have to learn from, from people, right, which is true of every position, every position I've ever had. It was important to get in there and learn as much as you can as quickly as possible. So um, I know the importance of it. It has been shared with me. I know that, um, you know, there's been great housing development um, and, and maybe a little bit less on the commercial side to support that. So I know it is a priority um, and, and I do plan on playing a role in that. Thank you. So Councilmember Meek, we also used that opportunity while you were working on the water and sewer plan. We were outside <laughs> making sure that Mr. Rosario <laughs> met with Ms. Ross, with, um, with Ms. Hecklinger, with, um, with Kathy Matthews to go over um, that what was happening in Germantown to give him an update, exchange business cards um, so that he could start that work right away um, you know, and jump in. We know we've awarded a $186,000 grant for Germantown Town Center placemaking and um, the look towards a business district. So 
Um, exciting things are happening. Um, Kathy told me why it didn't happen five years ago, but um, we are making um, progress really in that front. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Next up, Councilmember Jawando. Thank you. Welcome back. Thank you, sir. Um, it's good to see you. I've, I've enjoyed uh, getting to know you and working with you over the years. I really appreciate your service to the county and the fact that you're back for more. Um, I have two quick questions. The uh, How familiar are you with the up county, just as a region? Yeah. Um, I, without, you don't have to disclose where you live or anything, but because yeah. people will show up. But Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, so I, I, I lived in the up county for a little over a decade, actually more than that. Yeah, yeah, I would say about 12, 12 years. Um, you know, uh, I know someone who works there, um, I'm very close with, and um, <laughs> maybe even share a house, huh? Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's right. Um, and you know, like, like I said before, or, or I think, um, as, as was stated about me, my, my uh, children play sports um, in the up county. Uh, even though we don't live there, that's that's where they that's where they get their uh, hoop on, as they say, um, and, uh, and and play soccer. Um, yeah, I've, I've I've spent a good amount of time there. I I learned to be a supervisor there uh, as a patrolman, a patrol supervisor. All of my training was in Germantown, um, and you know I've I've worked a lot of cases there. Um, but right. yeah, that's not that doesn't feel good to say, but I have. No. And I'm on the Up County Hub Board of Directors. That's absolutely right. Forgot that's a good that. point to bring up. Yes, sir. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Um, I, I appreciate that. And I, th I think that's and not that you couldn't learn it, but it's good yeah. to know you have a baseline, uh, more than a baseline of support. I think as some of my colleagues have alluded to, the collaboration in this role and the innovation mm -hmm. required is there might not be a role in county government where that's uh, maybe council member, you know, mm -hmm. but uh, where it's more that you have to kind of just go and talk to meet. And I really appreciate it. Mm -hmm. Uh, you acknowledging the uh, presence and going to where mm -hmm. people are. Mm -hmm. I think you are coming in at a great time. We've had a lot of people in this role that have been great in these roles, including the indomitable Kathy Matthews. But you have a great team now. Some, some of your colleagues I see that are here mm -hmm. um, that do a really good job. And so I know you'll lean on them. Um, I would just, uh, I think there's a ton of opportunity, uh, mm -hmm. in the, particularly in the Up County. Mm -hmm to develop and strengthen and connect uh, what sometimes can seem as siloed or diver mm -hmm. divergent communities mm -hmm. um, and just because there's so much geography. Mm -hmm. So uh, I'm, I'm really looking forward to working with you to do that and please know that I'm an ally, we're an ally, our office, we want to help you do that. So that's all I have to say. Thank Congratulations. You, Thank, you you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Next up, Councilmember Glass. Uh, thank you, Mr. President, Mr. Rosario. Uh, Mr. Rosario, nice to meet you. Um, uh, I appreciate you starting with your story mm -hmm. uh, because where we come from informs others of where we're going mm -hmm. and who we care about. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, and thank you for being open uh, on TV about where you've been. Um, you know, I will not hold it against you being from the Bronx, as my entire family is from Brooklyn. Um, but uh, I see you, you did go to SUNY Albany, um, and I have plenty of friends who went to SUNY Albany as well. Uh, and your professional career, you've clearly been a busy guy. You're doing multiple things all the time, mm -hmm. um, and I think that will suit you extremely well for this position, mm -hmm. because if you stop, you're missing something. And you, you noted that people have been coming to you f with their problems in many of the positions you've had, um, and that's exactly what they will continue doing in this new position. Um, whether it's the problem solving, the community engagement, the public safety, um, or supporting our social safety net, those are all just four things of what you'll be working on. Um, and uh, as has been noted, but it needs to be stated again, not only is Kathy Matthews here, but there are many other members of the community engagement cluster um, who all have your back literally and figuratively, um, as do we. And I look forward to working with you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Councilmember Sales. Um, thank you um, for um, coming back and bringing your talents back to the community, uh, specifically in the up county. 
um, a very special part of our community. Um, I am very impressed with your extensive experience over the years and um, given the uniqueness of the Up County and your background um, as a regional services director, um, how would you balance the needs of the agricultural reserve in more developed parts of the Up County? Uh, thank you. Great question. Um, so I, I uh, it, growing up in the Bronx, you don't spend uh, a lot of time <laughs> in any sort of agricultural anything, uh, let alone an agri agricultural reserve. But I've been um, I've been getting a lot of schooling on it. I know it's okay. a it's a huge priority, right? I I understand that the nature of it. I understand that there, um, you know, 500 farmers, and 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 it's a very complex issue uh, of farms. There's a there's a complex issue. It, it varies because the agricultural reserve stretches across multiple communities, if you will, distinct communities that are, um, you know, very proud of who they are. Um, so you, I think your question was, how would I balance those needs? Yes. I, you know, I think I think balance, especially you know, after the last comment I heard, I think balance is going to be uh, a challenge. I think um, I think I'm going to have to. My intention is to tend to everything. Mm -hmm. um, I think I'm going to have to learn a bunch to figure mm -hmm. out where all the important things fit on this list of important things, right? Yeah. Um, so I, again, I, I've, I've, it's been made clear to me that um, it is a priority. It's been clear to me that there are complex issues. I know there are historical issues in terms of um, you know the transfer of rights um, and things, development rights. Um, I, I have to engage in a very aggressive educational process. Um, I, I hope. I hope people don't hold it against me that I know nothing about farms, but I'm going to learn a bunch um, and, and, and do what I can. I certainly will be listening. I don't doubt that uh, you will rise to the occasion if you are confirmed and look forward to working with you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Ma <coughs> Thank you. Councilmember Balcom. Hi, thank you. Nice to see you again, uh, Marilyn Balcom from the Upper West Side. Mm -hmm. And uh, have no fear. I, I, I said earlier, a year and a half ago, I knew nothing about the sewer envelope. <laughs> so I can Fair teach enough. you that, that, <laughs> thank that you. very thank you. important issue. Thank you. <laughs> uh, so, um, and many people have said it's about balance. Um, uh, Councilmember Jawando mentioned geography. Um, I worked for the Up County Regional Services Center rough 25 years ago or so with Kathy and um, this the boundaries of the regional services centers have not changed which means that um, forever the the up county um, boundary is significant geographic geography wise uh, but even with the g massive growth of population the boundaries haven't changed. So this is a really big job. Um, and uh, others have mentioned it. it's Ag, it's Germantown, it's Olney, it's Damascus, it really, uh, Montgomery Village, G Gaithersburg. Um, so, um, and you'll, you'll be able to see the difference between a city uh, with Gaithersburg and non-municipality and all the um, joys and, and uh, problems that that brings. So from the balance perspective, um, it's important for you, we're going to need you to be visionary. We're going to need you to be a leader in, in what can happen in the up county. Um, and so we need that thought leadership at the same time that you're going to be putting out fires every single day. Mm -hmm. So. Um, when you think about being proactive and being a visionary leader and being reactive to constituents, mm -hmm. um, can you just talk a little bit about um, functionally how you'll manage that? Uh, sure. Uh, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm a very detailed note taker, um, mm -hmm. right? You learned that in law school. But, but also, you know, connecting that to my law enforcement experience, it's, it's very similar. Um, you know, you, you, you have to be available and you have to note um, the requests that are made, but that's that's reactionary, right? You're always going to be trying to you're always going to try to be in the process of trying to catch up. If all you're doing is putting out fires, there has to be time to do things that are. And I don't want to use the word that can be ugly in law enforcement, but proactive. Um, you know, be 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 proactive about creating solutions. Um, I think a big part of of that, from a functional standpoint, is relationship building, 
right? So um, identifying solutions that don't continually rely on you know one one person or one point of potential potential failure is going to be the key. So if I hear from you know one I'll say person A or group A that this is a need part of what I have to become really, really good and effective at is figuring out, okay, who are the people or the person or people that can do that? And then what is their burden in terms of being able to address that? And, you know, is my solution sustainable, right? How often do I need to check in with it? How often do I need to, um, you know, evaluate whether it's working or not? So um, that that allows me, right, if, if I come up with a good solution, a good connection, if I know the right people to put in place, then I can be, that gives me more bandwidth to be proactive about some other things. And, and you're always working a list of priorities, like I mentioned before, right? So maybe I get a little further down, if you will, um, down that list and deal with more, more things. That's, that's how I think of that. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. I assume that BLTs up to this point didn't mean I meant more of a sandwich than a land use uh, uh, thing. But at any rate, um, next up, uh, Councilmember Katz. Thank you very much, <clears throat> Ruben. Thank you for being here, and thank I, I too have enjoyed our various chats. Mm -hmm. You probably had more with me than you wanted to, I guess. But <laughs> no. but uh, we we uh, have had some very good uh, discussions and some very fruitful discussions. And I also want to say that I, too, as was mentioned a couple of times, enjoyed hearing your story. You know, in this job, in all of our jobs, when, when someone comes to you with a problem, though there's times that you figure, well, that's not that big a problem to us. It's a huge problem to the person who's bringing it. Correct. And you always have to keep that empathy in mind. Correct. And I believe you are certainly that person that can do that. Um, they mentioned Kathy a couple times, and, and she certainly did a fabulous job. I remember when Marilyn Balcom actually worked there as well. And, but I also have to mention my good buddy Greg Wims. You're, you're filling some, some large shoes, yes, and, if, and, and uh, if he's listening, he, he knows that I know that. But it's also comforting to know, know that all of them are still here that when you have an issue, you're not gonna be able to do this job by yourself. Mm -hmm. None of us can. But when you have an issue, it is so comforting to know that Kathy Matthews, who we knew was Kathy Dorsey, we, we knew her back, back when, well, it is so comforting to know that everyone is there mm -hmm. and they wanna help you. They want you to be successful. And I also have to tell you, looking around the room at the various uh, uh, regional service directors who were here who came to, to literally have your back, that that's got to be a comfort as well. And you're going to have to do the same for them. Uh, as a person who was, I guess when, when I was uh, growing up, I don't know if I ever grew up, I always say I got older. But, but um, when I was getting older, Gaithersburg was considered the up county. There really wasn't a whole lot of up county beyond us. And we were considered, you know, country. Mm -hmm. um, King Farm was a farm, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. But the, the reality is that, yes, it has changed. Montgomery County has changed. But the needs have, are still there. And we all have to figure out what's the best way to get there. And I liked your answer very, very much, and I'll stop this, but I liked your answer very, very much when you said that, that you might not know that much about the ag world. Mm -hmm. I can tell you, I never grew up on a farm but there's plenty of farmers who will give me advice, for sure. <laughs> Thank you very Noted. much. I look forward to voting for you. Noted. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Appreciate that. Uh, next up, uh, Councilmember Fanny Gonzalez. I'm going to keep it short. Um, good afternoon, Mr. Rosario. I knew of you before we actually met, and that's thanks to the late Blanquita. Oh, yeah. yeah. She, I lived in Wheaton, and when she met my husband, who's Boricua, mm. she said, oh, you gotta meet this officer <laughs> named Rosario, and that never actually yeah. happened, but yeah. she spoke highly of you, yeah. um, especially when I shared with her things that were happening in my own neighborhood. Mm -hmm. um, so because of that, that's why I was excited to see your name on this package. So that's all I wanted to say, Thank and you. I look forward to working with you. Thank you. 
Thank you. And to close us out, uh, Vice President Stewart. Great. I just want to say um, thank you for your service and for continuing to want to serve uh, our great county. And uh, as Councilmember Glass said, as someone who grew up in Brooklyn and as a Mets fan, I guess mm. we'll <laughs> overlook that. Um, but we're really glad that you're looking uh, forward to doing this. And I do want to thank our other regional service folks who uh, came out today to support. Um, you're going to be joining a great group. And I look forward to working with you. Thank you. OK. Sierra uh, Madalena, did you have anything to add? Yeah, yes, thank you. I, I do want to um, also recognize Ms. Cardona and Mr. Fossilman, who I noticed were in the in the audience. I don't know if anyone else walked in, but um, I, obviously we're very excited um, to have him as part of the team. Hopefully you all know we meet with the regional services directors every other week to get the feedback of what's happening and try to coordinate with a bunch of the, the other organizations and departments in the county. Um, I also wanted to give out a shout out to um, Greg Wims. I'm sorry I forgot to do that earlier. I'm obviously someone who is still very engaged in at least District 39, but um, overall in the Up County. Um, and uh, Mr. President, um, since you've made the announcement about Mr. West joining in a, in a few weeks, um, you know I, I don't know how many times I get to be before the full council with Ms. Michelson here, but um, I probably can't say enough how much I've enjoyed working with her. I'm sure we're going to be hearing about it over and over, but just in case I don't have a chance to talk about that in front of the full council, I want to say thank you to Marlene mm -hmm. for um, all of her work, professionalism. We've had a chance to work on so many issues, but personally, she's been um, a great sounding board, um, loaded with advice for us, you know, for all of us who rode the pandemic through <laughs> county government. Um, she was a great support, certainly reaching out to my family when my father passed away. Um, she was a tremendous help, and I just wanted to say thank you on behalf of myself, my family, the executive branch, for all of your work, your contributions um, to the county um, and to all of us personally. You will be missed, um, and I'm sure your grandchildren will be thrilled <laughs> to spend, <laughs> to not have you as the staff director anymore, but, but have you as grandma, and good luck with the wedding. So thank you, Mr. President, for here, that. Here, here. You... Thank you. Happy to indulge that and appreciate the, the comments. And I know we all share in those sentiments as well. Mr. Rosario, I'll let you be the judge of whether people are looking over your shoulder or whether they have your back. I think there's a, maybe a thin line between those two uh, concepts. But really appreciate your interest in this role. Thanks again for your continued service to our community and to our county. We will be following up in very short order to take this up. So uh, stand by and stay tuned on that. But really appreciate your responses to the questions. And as you saw by every colleague uh, wanting to, to weigh in uh, how much interest they have in this role uh, and in uh, supporting uh, you and supporting those who serve in it. So thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Council. It's been an honor. Thank you. Appreciate it. Okay, we are literally right to the minute on schedule here. Uh, and as we have for the past few weeks, uh, we will continue our review of the uh, executive recommendations and the committee's work and recommendations on the FY25 to 30 capital improvements program. First up is item 10, review of the public safety committee's recommendations. And I believe we have the circuit court and I will Yield to you, Chair Katz, as we invite our guests up to join us here at the table. And with that, Chair Katz, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Mr. President. I see Judge Bonif Bonifant and others are coming forward, so I will try to keep this brief, Your Honor. Um, the, the committee did meet. It was uh, 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 unanimous that we approved at the council uh, st staff recommended approval as submitted, which we did. There is uh, very few changes uh, to the to what what we had uh, discussed, and of course the the one item that we need to continue uh, to talk about is the uh, uh, expenditures for the two-year warranties and the fire options to renew on the South Tower courtrooms. But we're working on that, and if. If it is with your approval, Mr. President, I will turn to Ms. Farrakh. Approved. 
Good afternoon, everyone. I just wanted to point out that my biggest concern about this project, which is a new project in the CIP, is whether or not it would have delays on the caseloads. Um, as you know, that there were caseload delays from COVID, and I just wanted to make sure that that was not exacerbated. I talked to Mr. Sheridan, uh, the court administrator, who advised that this would be done on a graduated basis, about two to four weeks for each classroom, I mean, for each courtroom, I'm sorry. Um, working on one room at a time would minimize the impact on the docket. Uh, the courthouse also has an additional courtroom available until they get their next judgeship. So that also provides some operational flexibility if there are any unexpected delays on the cons on the wiring of the AV equipment. And as Chair Katz mentioned, the, uh, the committee recommended approval. And if I could point out, Judge Bonifant is here if he... Your Honor, anything to add? Well, yes, you, you need to touch the... Yeah. To the right, to the right, there you go, there you go. Matt, that's why I brought Mr. Bonner with me. Yes, Matthew is the uh, leader of our technical services department, and uh, this is vital to the uh, South Tower. This is Tim Sheridan, who's the court administrator as well. So thank you for having us here. Uh, Thank you for approving this. Um, I was very pleased to hear the case load uh, is your concern. It is my concern every single day. We are facing uh, continued, uh, uh, Judge Cummins told me to stop using the word backlog, so I'm not going to use it, uh, but it's there, you know, and uh, we are asking the, uh, the state uh, for another judgeship here in the circuit court. I, Anybody who wants to help us on that, please uh, contact them and let us know because we, we need a, a judge as well, an additional judge. But uh, that's the reason why I brought Matthew. If you have any questions, Matthew really can explain the details of what uh, this project will be. So good to see you, Councilman Chuanda. It's been a while. So. So. Thank you. Okay. We have a committee recommendation. I don't see any colleagues in the queue. Uh, we will take a straw vote on that. All those in favor of the committee recommendation, raise your hand. That is unanimous among all those present. Ten to nothing. We're going to move on to our next item, item 11. Back to you, Chair Katz, with the it's Fire and Rescue Services <laughs> CIP. With Thank you, thanks Robert. to our guests from the judiciary for joining yeah, us. Fire Rescue Services CIP and. With per advanced permission, you may uh, pass it along to staff at your discretion. <laughs> wow, wow. You've heard me speak before. Um, the, the question is whether or not you want us to go through, it was, uh, there again, it was unanimous decisions, whether you want us to go through each individual project. How do you want to do this? I think you can go through each project and we can take up uh, questions if they come. Well, why don't, in fact, why don't I turn to... I would just go through the full yeah, list. Yeah, why don't we turn and to then, Ms. Farag? And yeah. Then if she, and then we can uh, add to it if it's, I doubt if it'll be And necessary. I'll just uh, ask Please. colleagues to, you know, get in, get in the queue. And okay. if there is a, you know, significant uh, discussion on a particular item, we can pause and see if there are multiple colleagues that have uh, comments on the same item. Sure. After reviewing uh, the fire CIP, the committee recommended 3-0 to approve everything as submitted by the county executive. They have a total of nine projects that total about $125 million over the six-year expenditure schedule. That's a slight decrease from the last amended CIP, and the cost decreased primarily due to the completion of the Clarksburg Fire Station. Uh, that was offset slightly by increases in several other projects. There is one new project for the fire department, and that's breathing air compressors replacement. Uh, the first one I'll talk about is the apparatus replacement program. That provides for an ongoing replacement of fire apparatus and EMS vehicles. And the list may change slightly as, need, as needs are reassessed. And I've got a list of the units that are anticipated to be replaced. The purpose of this is to make sure that they never fall short in any operational area due to apparatus needs. Um, and it's an ongoing project. Uh, the next one is the, the new project, the breathing air compressor replacement. Replacement. That new project supports replacement of breathing air compressor systems which have reached or are approaching the end of their service life. The compressor systems provide breathing air to self-contained breathing apparatus worn by firefighters. Compressors will be replaced at four stations in FY25, two stations in FY26, and 
three stations in FY27 and three stations in FY28. The next two projects are fire stations. The Rockville Fire Station, which is a volunteer-owned fire station, has had a renovation or replacement in the CIP uh, for several years. There is a one-time county contribution of $500,000. That's been acting as a placeholder. As those who are familiar with the Rockville area, um, it's, a, it's an undersized fire station at the moment. They really need more space and it's difficult to find the real estate in the vicinity to make sure that their call response times are appropriate for the area. So they've been working on that. I did recommend um, delaying that uh, just for fiscal capacity reasons and because they haven't, at the time, they had not made much progress. Mr. Dice indicated that they actually are much closer to making progress and the committee for that reason recommended no change to the expenditure schedule. For White Flint Fire Station 33, that project's been in the CIP since FY15 with an original cost of about $28 million. It's now $42 million. Uh, construction is expected to begin in May 2025 and end in November 2026. Um, I had recommended delay on this one, too, just because the fire department has a new master plan that really um, differently approaches how they look at their resources and how they um, respond to calls and they also take into consideration vulnerability of communities which that kind of overlaps with racial equity um, as we get into the operational budget you'll see from the operating budget equity tool that was provided um, I believe fire got a 7 out of 11 but I'm not quite sure but um, they've done a lot of work on community vulnerability and looking at how resources should provide appropriate services. It doesn't quite overlap with racial equity, and they're still working on building out the racial equity piece. Um, however, it is a, it's a 50-50, you know? If you um, delay it for a year to do more of this um, in-depth analysis, it could further escalate costs if they decide not to change anything. If you delay it a year and they decide they need differently right-sized um, services, it might actually save costs, but we don't know at this point. Uh, for that reason, and due to the fact that it might escalate costs, the committee at this point also recommended approval of the county executive schedule as, as submitted. Uh, the remaining projects are level of effort projects. Um, I wasn't going to go through them, but I'm happy to if you want because there are 37 fire and rescue stations across the county. These are kind of like the apparatus replacement program. They make sure that different fire departments are getting their needs met in terms of roof replacement, HVAC replacement, um, life sy safety systems, that type of thing, and um, resurfacing pavement, that type of thing. They're, they're pretty um, set costs. You know, they vary with um, some inflation, but generally speaking, they stay the same cost through the expenditure schedule, and we're not recommending any changes in those. Okay. Candidly, we, the committee, as I say, it was a 3-0 on, on uh, all of this. The committee realizes that these are life safety issues and that we can never have, uh, when, when, uh, when, when the crisis happens, we can never have um, uh, any failure with, with their own equipment which is the most necessary. And as an example, for Rockville Fire Station, and this is for Fire Station 3, Rockville has other fire stations. So it's the one right down the street on, on Hungerford uh, actually would be, uh, in, in case of an emergency, it would be the building, it would be the fire station that comes to this building. But we, we realize that there, there have been working on this. Uh, the, the, the Station 3 was built in 1965. And, and you hold up money and all of a sudden it becomes a problem. And, and it's the same thing for White Flint, the fire station with its number 33. Uh, it started out in, in 15 as a $27.8 million project. It's now estimated to be about $42 million. And, and there again, if we hold these up, when, when do you get to them? So the committee at a 3-0 felt that this was necessary. And, and I don't know that we want to go through every level of effort project, but we, we need each and every one of them. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you. I don't see any colleagues on this item wishing to speak. So with that, we'll take a straw vote on the uh, balance of the committee recommendation. All those in favor of the committee recommendation, please raise your hand. That is unanimous among all those present, 10 to nothing. 
We're going to move on to our next item, agenda item number 12. Uh, for the CIP, I see uh, our Department of General Services colleagues will stay. We have council staff uh, joining us as well. Uh, Ms. Yao, there was a joint committee uh, meeting uh, here to discuss this item between the Planning, Housing, and Parks Committee uh, and the Health and Human Services Committee. The reason for that, normally this would be a recreation facility that would only come to the Planning, Housing, and Parks Committee, but this is a facility that is envisioned to provide a much broader breadth of services and amenities to the Upper Western Montgomery County region, uh, something that I have worked on quite a bit, uh, and colleagues have continued uh, with that effort. Very much appreciate the work uh, that the uh, uh, Department of General Services and, and, and uh, Councilmember Balcom, uh, as a district uh, council member, represents this area, the town of Poolsville, and others who have been uh, very active uh, in this. We had a robust conversation about the uh, the cart and the horse, so to speak, in terms of the uh, program of uh, requirements and uh, the general time frame for how these projects move forward. It was the uh, view of the joint committee that uh, we should advance this project, that there still are some uh, questions that we need uh, to have answered, but there is no question that we want to move forward with uh, a project that will be a minimum of the amount that we're allocating uh, to, uh, uh, to this. Uh, it's a uh, approximately 15,000 gross square foot uh, facility, uh, and the program of requirements uh, is uh, imminently uh, expected and ongoing as part of active discussions between the Department of Recreation, Department of General Services, the town of Poolsville, and the broader community. And I know Councilmember Balcom and her team are very actively involved in all of those uh, conversations. Uh, with that, let me turn it over to Ms. Yao to see if. Uh, anything was missed? Uh, I think you pretty much summarized it well. <laughs> uh, anything from Recreation or Department of General Services? Uh, okay, we have a recommended project cost, $15.5 million program between FY28 uh, through FY30. Uh, with that, we have a joint committee recommendation. I don't see any colleagues wishing to speak. All those in favor of this, the district council members taking yes for an answer. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, that is unanimous, uh, 10 to nothing among all those uh, present. Thank you for that. Our next item on the agenda, item number 13, uh, is the Wheaton Arts and Cultural Center. Chair Jawando, would you please share the recommendation of the Education and Culture Committee? Absolutely. Uh, Happily, uh, this is an important project. As I know the district council member, I think all colleagues know. Um, we met uh, recently and uh, last year, just for context, the council amended the CIP uh, to allow uh, our Department of General Services to conduct a site evaluation for co-location uh, of mixed-use development. And we approved the supplemental appropriation uh, of $75,000 to allow MHP and the county to apply for a low-income housing tax credit for the housing project. Very pleased, we got, we got an update on the progress uh, from DGS, um, and the, uh, or, uh, including the, uh, the uh, community town hall and the overall timeline. Um, and you know we, we found out, and I think people know, there's gonna be a 40,000 square foot building along with, uh, for the Arts Center, along with 320 uh, multifamily units, 39 townhomes, and 15,000 square feet of office space. So still in the thunder, but hap happy to do it. Um, and so we unanimously recommended approval. Uh, and with that, I'll turn it back to you. Or to, our, to whoever you want to. S yes, uh, thank you. Let me turn it to the district council member, uh, council member Fanny Gonzalez. Uh, very quickly, I just wanted to, and thank you so much for, to the committee for uh, approving this, and I look forward to the rest. I am so excited, I can't even talk, uh, of the committee to also approve. <laughs> that, that won't last long. <laughs> oh, you know me so well. I just wanted to mention that we're going to have our first uh, town hall session to talk about what's going to happen inside these structure the meeting with DGS is going to happen on April 24th at 6 p.m. at the Wheaton Library in every single one of my events I always offer dinner so there's going to be food there um, every single council member here is invited to please come if you can um, and I thank I thank the county executive and the DGS team for all 
um, their work in partnership on this. Thank you. Terrific. I don't see any other colleagues in the queue. We have a committee recommendation from the Education and Culture Committee. All those in favor of the recommendation, please raise your hand. That is unanimous, 10 to nothing among all those present. I, you know, who says that we? this is not a group that gets to unanimous support? Uh, this CIP, at least pre-reconciliation, is an indication that, <laughs> that we... All the fighting yeah. space. That, 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 that we are. Okay, we're going to move on uh, to our last item of the day, uh, which is the item number 14, the CIP review of the Parks Department. Uh, I will just... Uh, as the Parks Department and Ms. Dunn and the Planning Board Chair uh, are uh, joining us, I'm going to turn it over uh, to uh, Council staff. I'll just note, uh, as has been the case frequently, uh, we are you know, facing significant affordability reconciliation uh, here. The committee has worked quite hard in trying to figure out and get to a point where we are prioritizing the uh, most important uh, priorities, recognizing that there are uh, some uh, challenges that we have to work through. I will note that uh, the executive in these cases has the easy job, we have the hard job. Uh, there's just a, an affordability reconciliation of how much overall would need to be cut in order to make uh, the numbers work, but then we have to decide uh, among parks, facilities, and projects that are some of the most relied upon you know, public open spaces, recreational opportunity, mental health uh, opportunities, wellness uh, opportunities, gathering spaces, you know, for communities and for residents. So, um, you know, that is the, the spirit in which we uh, went about this. I'll just, you know, there's a lot of details here. I can, uh, you know, turn it over to, to staff. Perhaps before we go through uh, the items one by one, we could turn it to the Planning Board Chair and the Parks Department. Uh, to give some uh, initial comments, and then I'll turn it over to Ms. Dunn uh, to walk us through the specific recommendations uh, with the specific projects. Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you so much for having us today. We, other than to say thank you, and we appreciate how you appreciate how important Parks is to the county, and we'll just turn it over to Ms. Dunn or, or, or Director Figueredo, but we'd like to just move this along, but thank you for having us be here. <laughs> Absolutely. Happy to hand this over to Pam. Okay, 36 ongoing projects, two new projects. The county executive recommends funding at $303 million, uh, which is a uh, very small uh, increase that doesn't meet the inflationary increases and other uh, dynamics. So that's the, the headline. Let me turn it over to uh, Ms. Dunn for the details. Good afternoon, Council, and thank you. Um, yes, as the uh, President just noted, the Capital Improvements Program for the MNC PPC Parks Program um, consists of 38 projects. Um, 36 of those are ongoing. There are two new projects. Um, and the County Executive has recommended funding at $303 million. This is uh, about a 2.3 percent increase from their currently approved CIP, um, but falls short of their um, proposed or recommended CIP for the coming fiscal um, years, um, and it is short by $24.2 million. Um, in the county executive's budget, that's um, noted as a reconciliation PDF, affordability reconciliation PDF, um, which reduces the current revenue expenditures by $11 million and the government obligation bonds uh, expenditure by $13.2 million. So what you'll see, we have a second page of the uh, cover sheet for the staff report. The staff report goes through every single PDF. We include uh, a chart showing you what the funding level is for each of the six years of the CIP. It shows what the current funding level is, what the recommended change is, um, and it and indicates whether or not it is affected by the affordability reconciliation PDF via a response to that reconciliation PDF by the Parks Department and the Planning Board. Um, so those are the details. They're all in the staff report. But on the second page of the cover sheet, we really have a nice summary for you. I'm going to go through slowly the summary, and then we can turn to any details that you'd like. And then also at the very end, we will also turn to sort of that conversation about how do you, how and what do you do to meet the reconciliation PDF is where we'll spend most of our time. So with that, I'll just repeat that there are the two new PDFs 
uh, or two new PDFs. These are replacement PDFs. They aren't the two new ones. These are replacement. There are uh, two PDFs for planned life cycle asset replacement um, maintenance projects that are ongoing. One is for local parks. One is for non-local parks. They're separated that way for mo primarily for funding sources. The CIP recommends replacing the current ones because they exist with um, several sub uh, PDFs and categories. And this will replace those without those subcategories. This has been something that the Parks Department has agreed to with the analysts at OMB. Um, so, continuing, um, as already mentioned, um, the CE's budget not only included an affordability reconciliation PDF, uh, but it also has a recommendation to change the funding source for the pollution prevention and repairs project as well as the stream protection stream valley park project um, and this would replace long-term financing um, with water quality protection bonds um, and primarily uh, for the pollution prevention pdf this moves uh, about 3.3 .3 million dollars from fy24 into the new cip and for the stream protection pdf this moves about 4.3 million dollars into the next um, cip um, the next thing is that there are two new projects, as we've already mentioned. One is an acquisition product project. This is called the Silver Spring Park Benefit Payments Project, and this is to collect money um, from development applications as they go through the review process in downtown Silver Spring, where they may not be able on their site to provide some open space or public amenity. They can put money into the park fund. Um, the second project is a development project, which several council members are excited about. I think you all know about it. It's the Littonsville Civic Green, um, and this will be constructed along the Purple Line um, in the area of the Littonsville Rosemary Hills neighborhood. Um, beyond that, the uh, Planning Board proposes modifications to a handful of its uh, 36 ongoing projects. Those are listed for you, as I mentioned, on the second page of the um, summary. They are also all individually um, in the staff report with all the details. Um, there's also a number of projects, and actually the majority of projects proposed by the Parks Department are being proposed with what we call minor or consent level changes. These are honestly just two additional years to the CIP. Those two additional years are two ongoing projects, projects that haven't been completed, and they're at the same funding level as currently exists. We don't see them as a significant change, either in scope or in funding, ultimately. And then last are the modifications um, to projects that were put forward to meet the Executive's Affordability Reconciliation PDF. Um, and these are primarily uh, for the trails, natural surface and resource-based recreation, the trails hard surface renovation, uh, trails hard surface design and construction, Vision Zero, and Wheaton Regional Park improvements. The committee did discuss this at length. The planning board, when it met, it went through um, recommendations by park staff on how to meet that reconciliation PDF, and it proposed um, those reductions and then put forth uh, two tiers of hopeful restorations for those projects um, based on what they feel like they need to do to complete and to support the park system. Um, those are toward the end of the staff report. Um, I'll tell you what page here in one second. Uh, starting on page 23, uh, the committee had uh, discussions about this with the Parks Department and the Planning Chair and, or Parks Chair, and um, you'll notice that there's uh, proposed um, reductions that the committee agreed um, to restoring and proposed for the council, the, restoring the first tier. Um, so I'm happy to answer, and I'm sure they're happy to answer any questions you have about that restoration, what that entails. Great. We have two colleagues in the queue. Let me turn it over uh, perhaps to Parks just to explain what the uh, just briefly summarize what restoration of tier one and what impact that would have. This was really the entire nature of the conversation uh, that we had at the committee. So I think it's, uh, it will be helpful for colleagues. Thank you, um, Mitty Figueredo, Parks Director. Uh, when we um, were asked to find $24 million in reductions, $11 million in current revenue, and another 13 or so in geo bonds, we had to go to the few PDFs where we had actually requested an increase um, because we were very targeted in our requests for this cycle um, and really geared it towards 
equity projects where we needed to make some investments in new park like Littonsville, trails where we have federal funds that we're implementing and we wanted to be able to continue to do our ongoing work while we were um, doing the uh, providing the matching funds for those federal grants and our um, PLAR non-local, which is really what funds the um, maintenance of what is now a hundred-year-old park system. So when we had to find those twenty-four million dollars in reductions, we had to go to where the money was. Where did we ask for the increases? And what that meant was um, taking the money out of the requested increases in geo bonds for Wheaton Regional Park. That took a, a big hit. Um, our hard surface trails, PDFs, both of them, design and construction and renovation. Um, and then primarily on the current revenue side, it hit two of our PDFs, which um, where we had requested an increase in current revenue, and that was, again, PLAR non-local and our natural surface trails PDF. So as we um, brought our requested um, tiers to the planning board and then to the planning housing and parks committee at the council um, we uh, we at, we broke them down into two different tiers and requested rest restoration of funds for um, Wheaton Regional Park um, our hard surface renovation PDF and then the two other PDFs where we had asked for increases in current revenue and what the restoration of some of those funds would do would be to um, basically prevent delays in some of these projects where we're trying to move things along. So if we had our full funding for Wheaton Regional Park, for example, I think we could complete all of those planned improvements that are set forth in the Wheaton Regional Park Master Plan within a decade. Um, under the county executive's proposal, it would take us 20 years or more. With what the Planning, Housing, and Parks Committee recommended, we're much closer to our initial plan for this, and we can, we're looking at maybe a dozen years. Um, as opposed to 20 under the county executive's recommendation. Um, and the same um, with uh, the hard surface trail um, restoration. It just means less delay of other planned projects like improvements, for example, or renovation to the Rock Creek Trail, which is in pretty rough shape, as well as a little falls trail, for example. It allows us to implement the projects with those rays and safe streets for all grants without delaying other projects that are needed. And then of course PLAR non-local, that's um, you know all the kind of um, fixes that our parks need. In fact, we just recently got a communication, I think in the last few days, informing us that there is a, a major um, issue at one of our parks buildings um, where um, we may need to replace the roof that's going to cost like half a million dollars. And these things come up and that's what those, that's what those categories fund. So definitely the, the committee's um, vote to restore our tier one is very welcome to us and, and, and very helpful. Appreciate that. I think the context is very important to understand what the, the, the restoration of the cuts actually mean. I think, um, you know, PLAR, you know, we were talking about systemics in the mm -hmm. school system. PLAR really is the equivalent uh, of systemic uh, in the uh, parks uh, budget uh, on the capital side uh, as well. Uh, with that, let me turn to colleagues, uh, starting with Council Member Sales. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, and thank you, Parks and Planning, for uh, this uh, packet preparation. Um, I noticed that um, in FY 23 and 24, um, there were reductions of a million dollars uh, total. And then in subsequent years, I see a million dollars total of reductions regarding Vision Zero. And just wanted to know what the impact of those reductions are. Uh, good afternoon, Andy Frank. I head up the Park Development Division, and um, yes, as part of the um, as part of meeting the affordability, uh, we we had to pull back on some of our quests for Vision Zero, mm -hmm. um, but that doesn't mean that there isn't uh, funding in Vision Zero that's going to allow us to to help move the program along, and with the grant uh, funding that we received that uh, that Mitty had referenced. We do believe that we are uh, going to be moving forward with our priority projects. Of course, uh, having that additional million dollars that's in the restoration, of course we would 
put that every penny of that to good use in terms of trail safety and crossing safety and traffic calming uh, if that was available of course uh, but we in prioritizing uh, different things we did feel that we did have uh, some funding to move forward with uh, projects in that regard and we were balancing the tiers um, with other priorities and things uh, such as the Wheaton Regional Park and the overall trail system so uh, as Mitty had said um, you know the getting the full funding of the the tier one is very much appreciated and we would work with that and and try and work all, as much of the vision zero as we could of course though we would um, we would certainly utilize any additional funding for vision zero that would become available yeah so what specifically is being impacted and where so um, the vision zero projects we have over 140 intersections all throughout the county mm -hmm. um, they are prioritized I don't have a list with me um, but we are focusing right now we have projects in Sligo uh, we have projects um, in uh, the uh, Rock Creek area uh, which we're moving forward with uh, we have a lot of uh, vision zero crossings connected to our natural surface trails program um, I couldn't say exactly which ones would be impacted or are somewhat delayed we would try and be moving forward with them we've we've got them in a priority queue we've yeah. got uh, many of them in design we have many of them waiting for construction right now um, so I couldn't tell you exactly where they are but our yeah. priority is based on uh, crash data safety and equity is our primary that's how we prioritize and put those forward first yeah that's the part of my question is asking you know how do you select the priority areas and which areas are going to be impacted because of the lack of funding and how soon can you get that information we we have um, vision zero projects I mean it's primarily yeah. trail crossings and traffic calming um, we have those projects all over the county and yes. as Andy said yeah. we prioritize them based on data um, as well as equity issues the usage that those crossings get if they're heavily used that's something that we're going to look at um, we don't have uh, I, I don't think we have like an exact list of all of the projects in a priority order but I think we could get so you, you a little bit more information on that we it's not a um, like we I obviously have, have a list of what's a, coming yeah, up in the immediate something yeah. projects you're doing 75 of those based on ABCD criteria and so you don't have that planned out but you are reducing the budget by a million dollars well we were we were requesting an increase in the in the in the program over the next six years um, and a lot of that was related to the SS 4a and the um, and and the raise grants um, and that part of that was the matching so those to sort of answer that question on where the increased funding would go uh, those particularly are targeted to Matthew Henson trail connections um, to Wheaton Regional Park and surrounding areas and to Sligo Creek Park uh, uh, Sligo Creek Stream Valley Park which it contains many units those are the that's where that that um, uh, one million dollars comes comes from they were added in pr projects so our ex so um, what that would do it would it would slow down some of the projects uh, mm -hmm. in those areas but we would also obviously work on trying to economize as best we can and to uh, we will obviously be back over this time frame and uh, you know reevaluating uh, the projects those are the locations that are primarily included in this one million dollar reduction um, again certainly those are areas where uh, if we had the money we would implement the programs a little bit faster that is absolutely true okay I think I was just concerned about the traffic calming areas but as the council president so, mentioned that we so made the sure. committee made the recommendations to yeah so well just to be clear I just want to like clarify yeah. so yeah. 
The way that it works is that the county executive sends over the capital budget request. As part of that, there is a reconciliation affordability PDF. Essentially what that means is here are the cuts that you would need to make in these years in order to actually make this work. But he says, and this is not this particular county executive, this is just the way the process works. I'm not trying to be hypercritical here, but it's a nice gig as the county executive because the county executive sends to us the you all figure out what cuts you would make to what individual PDFs. Not projects per se, sometimes PDFs are projects. In this case, Vision Zero is a very large countywide uh, 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 you know, series of projects that are all captured in, in one, uh, one area. The board, like the school system, then as an outside agency, then has to decide how they're going to absorb $24 million in cuts, a very large mm -hmm. cut to their request. And they prioritize existing funding. And as part of it, they put forward, you know, here is what our non-recommended cuts are. Here's what we would ask for you to restore, which requires more money, both current revenue dollars and geo bond funding as part of the capital budget reconciliation. So the committee, looked at the different tiers and decided to move forward with restoring tier one funding, which restores some, but not all, of the Vision Zero uh, funding in addition to other funding, including for Wheaton Regional Park, uh, including for, uh, for trails. So that's the, the decision before us today is whether or not to agree with the committee to restore a portion of what the county executive had done in terms of you know projected cuts subject to reconciliation of the capital budget which obviously we're not here yet as we heard from all the other items mm -hmm. through this discussion the prior discussions that we uh, have uh, had here there are going to be a lot of moving parts and moving pieces that we're going to have to uh, to to figure out but it they're not suggesting to us that we cut their budget request. <laughs> they are offering to us, if you are going to cut us, these are the ways that we could absorb in the most reasonable process. Yeah. And we would like you to restore, to the extent possible, these priority areas, including Vision Zero, of which we restored some, but not all, of what they requested based on the tiering structure. And Did I think based on that information, I wanted to know what's at risk. If we're not able to fund it completely, especially for Vision Zero specifically, what's at risk? What are we losing out on? Especially the traffic calming. So, Trails, I'm, I'm fine with delaying, but yeah. what traffic calming so intersections tra tra are we traffic delaying? Calming, so our traffic calming program right now, mm -hmm. uh, we are active on, Sl on Sligo Creek Parkway. Uh, we've gone, we were going from north to south, so we were working from University Boulevard down. We have gotten. Um, Which ones are we not going to be able to address? Because it, the, the ones that would be delayed would be the furthest ones to the south in the direction we're working in tandem with with uh, Montgomery County Department of Transportation on integrating uh, road rehabilitation with Vision Zero. Um, so we're working from up there and down towards New Hampshire Avenue. Um, and in Beach Drive, we're also active on Beach Drive, and we are starting, actually, we're starting construction up near Garrett Park Drive at the north end, and we're working our way down. Mm -hmm. So it's not a clean um, north to south, because there are some areas, particularly in, when you think about Beach Drive, we have a very important project that's already in our queue for Stony Brook area. That's a very, uh, Linden Lane, Stony Brook area, it's very, uh, be a really neat connection to be able to make safely under the beltway there, um, but the ones that would be de would be delayed are most likely mostly the ones towards the south in those two areas in terms of traffic calming. We are active on those projects. We are trying to move as, as efficiently as we can, um, uh, and we we talk about we're going to have a we are going to have a communication uh, a, a, a upcoming about the parks road PDF and how we feel that we could create some cost savings that may allow us to get a little bit faster on some of these vision zeros on our parkways by incorporating those projects together. So we'll move as quickly as we can. But those are those are really, it's really the, the southern end of uh, Sligo and the southern end of Beach Drive that would be most affected. 
Uh, thank you for answering my question. Thank you. I'm sorry. I misunderstood. Uh, Council Vice President Stewart. Really sorry, just because it's my district. Uh, <laughs> and so I, I felt like I, I do want to say thank you um, for the work you're doing because the southern uh, end of it, as we know, also has purple line construction and other issues uh, happening. So while I want to, I completely agree with council member sales on moving forward I also understand where we have some struggles as we get to the southern part of Sligo Avenue with other projects that are happening but I just want to say thank you for all your work that you're doing in this area it is our absolute pleasure and do you want to just quickly explain there are three parkways and then there are trail crossings at intersections with other roadways that is what we're focused on here so I just could you just Sure. I basically just said it because you want to just reiterate sure. that because I this Our is not three, there, there are broader yes. vision zero goals some of which is yes. in coordination with Department of Transportation some of which is in coordination with State Highway Administration right. but the projects that the Parks Department is responsible for are on the Our, three parkways yes so and are, on intersections where a trail is bisecting a road absolutely absolutely and and those are the 140 more or less that were that we are looking at uh, we own the three parkways, Little Falls Parkway, Beach Drive, and uh, Sligo Creek Parkway. And as any of the users of, of those areas, particularly Beach Drive and Sligo, have numerous crossings, numerous places where uh, what we like to call our community connections. And this is where everybody from the neighborhoods get into the park system. And that is the area, you're absolutely right, where we have this conflict between our parkways and those wishing to travel by vehicles and those wishing to uh, bring their kids in strollers, bring people on bikes, all the different uh, ways you would get out of that, out of your neighborhood and into the parks. Those are the primary ones that we're considering. Um, and what we're doing, we do have a, a plan that does a combination of traffic calming to keep the speeds at safe levels on all of the parkways, as well as the Vision Zero crossings, which provide raised crosswalks, narrowed, uh, narrowed intersections, more visibility, all sorts of ways that we can get people safely across those roadways, those primary roadways, and into the park system, uh, is primarily Stream Valley Parks along there. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Councilmember Mick. All right. Thank you for those details. That's helpful. And uh, and w thank you very much for the work that you all did to, to parse through how uh, the, the committee and the council can look at this and try to figure out how to approach um, dealing with some of these potential reductions here. Uh, and uh, great thanks to the committee for your diligence in really fine-toothing all of these and, and uh, making sure we have a plan that's going to, that's going to work. Uh, it's going to be fiscally responsible, but is also going to be responsive to a community that every time there is any kind of uh, budget public hearing <laughs> since since I have been on the council, of course we are flooded with folks who are telling us that parks are extremely important to them, um, that they need our trails to be maintained, uh, and that they're very, very concerned about any potential reductions. So very much appreciate uh, the efforts, uh, the joint efforts of all of you here before us today and your teams as well as uh, the committee for us to be able to address uh, some of these, uh, some, again, some of these potential reductions, acknowledging that we can't restore everything that we would like to. Some tough decisions have to be made, um, but I think that this has landed in a good place. Um, and wanted to uh, particularly note one particular park that there's there's a lot in here that's going to benefit, of course, a lot of my constituents. I'm not going to name all of them, but I will cite this one particular one that I've had a couple of comments and questions about on the Northwest Branch, uh, Branch Recreational Park. Um, and there, I've gotten a couple questions about a potential disc golf course there. And uh, I'm glad to see that funding is moving and all of those things, but just emphasizing, uh, you know, of course, the importance of, of outreach and communication there and any way that my office can be supportive of that would love to be uh, looped in and if there's anything I see your finger on the button please feel free to if you have any updates on that that'd be great sure sure we're actively in design of a, uh, a disc golf course that we're really excited about this is on the north side of Bonifant right uh, near the trolley museum we're actually gonna co-locate in some ways we've got a little synergy between the museum and folks who would do disc golf uh, we are in design this would be uh, in the area adjacent to the trolley museum uh, in an open open areas um, where where uh, this is a project this will be uh, funded through our minor new construction non-local project also funded by geo bonds 
uh, that would be uh, that would be something that where you know geo all geo bonds would help. Um, but uh, we are uh, we we are in the process of engaging a um, a design builder who specializes in disc golf courses, and we are um, also doing some uh, infrastructure <laughs> improvements. Uh, such as there'll be some parking, there's going to be a picnic pavilion, there's going to be water fountains uh, and kiosks to explain all the rules and everything. Um, and we would be uh, happy to give a briefing on that project to, to anyone on your staff to explain it. We do appreciate we, as far as uh, I've been told, is we've gotten uh, pretty broad support for that. People are looking for this new activity in the uh, Montgomery Parks, so we're pretty excited to hopefully deliver it. To you, um, I, it's recorded, so I will say uh, hopefully starting <laughs> construction in FY25, given that all this uh, discussion of the budget goes well, uh, and then hopefully uh, delivering it within the, you know the next uh, year to year and a half. Appreciate that. Very exciting, and uh, we will reach out and um, you know lots of folks who are excited about it. Folks who also have questions about impact on neighborhood and all of the usual things where you know the, the, that type of outreach and communication is always beneficial. So glad to work with you all, and thanks very much. Okay, sounds good. I don't see any other colleagues in the queue, and so it seems like we are ready to take a straw vote on the committee recommendation. For the Park CIP, all those in favor, please raise your hand. That is unanimous, 10 to nothing among those present. With that, we are done for the day. Colleagues, we are adjourned. PBJ, 590 AM on the Interstate 270 corridor, WPDD, 1070 AM.